welcome to the Montgomery County Commission on Aging's public forum on in-home care. We can do better. And thank you for joining us today. I'm David Engel with the Commission on Aging. Our event today will focus on how we can help our older adults age in place. In Montgomery County, most older residents neither qualify for government assistance options nor are wealthy enough to afford the high cost of in-home services. We use the term senior gap to identify this group. It is estimated that over 25,000 older county residents fall into this category, and this number will only continue to increase. The senior gap population, as well as everyone else, needs more high quality options to allow them to remain safely in their homes for as long as they would like. Today's program will feature a keynote speaker followed by panel speakers with questions and answers. And then later this afternoon, we'll have another panel session with three more speakers. I'd like to welcome our county leaders and their staff who are here today, including the mayor of Gaithersburg, Judd Ashman. Thank you for partnering with us during your Active Aging Expo. Coming up before our keynote speaker, we have some welcoming remarks from our County Executive, Mark Elrich. In Montgomery County, we have over 75 boards, commissions, and committees that are actively involved in matters affecting the quality of life in Montgomery County. The Commission on Aging serves as an advocate for the health, safety, and well-being of the county's older residents. The Commission supports safety net services for the frail and elderly. They also create programs to meet the needs of older adults who want to age in their homes and this great community. The Commission on Aging identifies significant issues where its voice on the needs of older adults can make a difference. I congratulate the Commission on Aging for developing the public forum to highlight the challenges and provide the in-home care resources available for our county residents. The pandemic has strengthened individuals' desire to age in place. The county needs to respond by strengthening the resources for private paid caregivers and family caregivers. Known as a community for lifetime, we can come together to find solutions. During the time of isolation for older adults, the county has done a great job helping homebound seniors. We've accomplished one of the highest senior vaccination rates in our country. Our transportation department has helped connect seniors to doctors and their needed appointments. The senior meal delivery program has delivered hundreds of thousands of meals and continues to help older and frail adults who otherwise would go hungry. But we can do better to bring awareness to the county's services and to those in need with programs with medical assistance and health care, and especially, as you will hear today, in-home care. I hope you take away today information that helps you improve the lives for those you care for. Thank you to the Commission on Aging for creating a public forum highlighting in-home care issues and bringing to light tools and resources to help our community improve the care to those most in need. And now I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Joanne Lynn. Dr. Lynn is an experienced geriatrician, educator, quality improvement coach, and researcher. She works half time with Representative Tom Suozzi as a health and aging policy fellow and otherwise consults with long-term care reform endeavors across the country. She was one of the first hospice physicians, a tenured professor at Dartmouth and at George Washington, a medical officer in the Centers for Clinical Standards and Policy at CMS, and the director of the Bureau for Cancer and Chronic Disease in the Public Health Office for Washington, D.C. Joanne has published 300 professional articles and 80 books and chapters, as well as dozens of white papers, court briefs, and guidelines. In addition to an MD degree, she has a master's in quantitative clinical sciences and a master's in ethics and public policy. She is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, a master in the American College of Physicians, a fellow of the Hastings Center and the American Geriatric Society, and a member of the National Academy of Social Insurance. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker. 
fun to be in a place where I'm speaking to humans and not <laughs> Zooms. <laughs> but I am here as a disruptor. I am here because I am 70 years old and nothing has changed in my lifetime that matters. We are now facing the prospect of having half of the middle class homeless in old age. The average person at retirement now has less than $50,000 in total assets beyond their social security. The most important thing about the Area Agency on Aging is that they are just about the only part of the federal government funding that is required to do advocacy. And the most important thing about you being here and you being on the Zoom is that you can do the advocacy also. We have kicked the can down the road for generations. We are now almost at the end of the road. Let's get some facts straight. The average American will spend two years in old age unable to take care of themselves. They will need someone else, their family, an aide, a neighbor, to be helping them out. Among women, this is a women's issue. We were dumb enough to marry men two years older, and they die two years younger, so we get widowhood and diminished income. So we do the caregiving, and then we have no one to take care of us, and no money to pay for it. This is set up to be a disaster. We are going to double the number of elderly people needing care between 2015 and 2035. We have nothing in the plans to increase the financing. Indeed, we have nothing in the plans to fundamentally change how we provide the services. There's a study you should look up online. It's called More Than a Meal. It was done by an elegant uh, research design. It was published in good papers. They took half a dozen cities in the US where the waiting list for food for homebound people was more than six months and randomized people into three groups. People who got Meals on Wheels, people who got food delivered once a week and a microwave, and people who got nothing. And lo and behold, it showed that people do better with food. <laughs> and in fact, people do better with a little socialization, actually seeing another person. Now your grandmother could have told you that, and I suppose it's nice to know how much better. But isn't it shocking that in this country, you could recruit half a dozen cities where the waiting list for food was longer than six months? What were people supposed to do with a waiting list for food that's longer than six months? We forget that it is different to be an elderly person in need of supportive services than it is to be a 65-year-old in need of a hernia operation. So when Medicare passed in 1965, the average American need was the cost of surgery. And by damn, Medicare does one hell of a job in getting you surgery. You can't keep your hernia if you want it because some doctor is gonna persuade you to get it fixed. We didn't think that it was about drugs because drugs weren't very costly. But eventually along the way, we got drugs covered because pharma has a whole lot of money and talked to a whole lot of leadership about getting it covered. That's why we have drugs covered. Why don't we have long-term care covered? Why don't we have ears and eyes and teeth and feet covered? Where is the lobby for it? We don't have any party with deep pockets who's pushing for those sorts of things. Again, we face the prospect that that senior gap population that you've noticed to be present in Montgomery County, I almost laughed at the 25,000 rate. The issue is of course, that there's another 25,000 in the wings six months later and another 25,000 in the wings six months after that. We have a huge number of people who are going to spend down to poverty in this county in old age. And where are our plans? Our leadership says, oh, we're very concerned about the elderly. Damn it, put the money there. Start putting real reforms in place. 
Montgomery County spends half again as much as the national average on the medical care of elderly people. We have enough money circulating around, but we're using it in hospitals, doctors, and, and uh, skilled nursing facilities. We aren't using it in in-home support. 50 years ago, Singapore started requiring that all, that's all residential buildings and major renovations be accessible to wheelchairs. Not 10%, not 12%, everything. So now there's no problem finding a place where a person who needs a wheelchair can live. What's the practice in Montgomery County? Can you readily find a place in which a person who needs a wheelchair can live? How often do people have to go to a nursing home because their home is inaccessible? Because there's no bathroom on the first floor? Because the bathroom door is too narrow to get through? Because there's no handrail? Now Montgomery County has some programs to help with those things, but what if they were already built in? What if we, we all had those things? Wouldn't that be nifty? Wouldn't that be a good idea? What if we provided home care geographically? If you go to a hospital in Sweden with a crushed vertebra, a pretty common thing to happen to elderly people and especially women, the ER doctor would make the diagnosis as they would here. They'd give you some pain medication. They'd say, we don't really have much to do for that, but it will get better, it will heal up. Uh, but you're going to end up being on your back for at least a few days and then gradually getting back to being able to get up and around. Your doctor, Dr. Smith, who serves that area will give you a call the tomorrow. And your nurse, who I know by name, you know, Naomi and Marie, I know them and they're both really good. They will give you a call before nine o'clock tomorrow morning and they will see you tomorrow to see that everything's set up for your recovery. Here, what you get is a list of the home care agencies. Good luck figuring them out. Call them up, see who, ha who, can, who can see you. Maybe three days later, and you call your primary care doc and the primary care doc says, uh, you know, I'm really uncomfortable prescribing opioids. Um, you'll have to talk to the orthopedist about that. And the orthopedist says, oh, I don't do that at all. <laughs> and, and there's just no coordination for a very commonplace issue. A very commonplace thing. We didn't think about how to provide care for long-term care in 1965 when Medicare passed. There was almost none of it. And almost all of it could be done by family. The average age at death was under 70. The usual causes of death were stroke, heart attacks, and infections. There wasn't a big number of people who made it into their 80s and 90s, and we didn't think we could do anything for them at that point anyway. There was no surgery on 90 year olds, the way there is now. <laughs> so we need to rethink how we provide services. You can't tell readily, I can tell, but you can't tell readily how many people are left adrift in Montgomery County. How many families are bankrupted? How many people have terrible pressure ulcers as they die? How many families have had to give up work? The things that matter aren't available to you. You can tell how many de deficiencies a particular nursing home has had. You can't tell how many people went through that nursing home on their way from a hospital to the nursing home, to home, to back to the hospital, back to the nursing home, in the cycle that we've set up to try to evade the fact that we don't actually support long-term care. We need policies on long-term care. I think we need two things, and they're both terribly relevant to this population. First, we need some US examples of excellence. We need some communities to do it right. And Gaithersburg, Mayor Gaithersburg, or Montgomery County, Ehrlich and crew, could set out to be that example. The example needs to be measuring how we're doing. What has been the impact on the families? What has been the impact on the people coming to the end of their lives in old age. We need to be able to monitor that, set priorities, tackle those priorities, move money around, move resources around. People keep talking about raising the salaries of direct uh, care workers from an average in the country of $12.5 to $15. Daggone it, nobody can live in Montgomery County at $15 an hour at a full-time job. We have to talk about doubling it. 
Yeah, we won't get doubling it. We'll have to compromise. But if we don't talk about it, we'll never get it. So the direct care worker has the hardest job in America. The hardest job to go into somebody's home, create a relationship across all manner of cultural and generational divides, support somebody who's not necessarily making terribly good sense, who might sometimes be violent or even rather bullheaded. And, and nevertheless, manage to help that person get dressed, get clean, get fed, do the things that they can no longer do for themselves. And we're paying them drib dribble? We're paying them nothing? Come on, it's because they don't have a union. It's because they aren't steel workers. It's because they're women, and especially women of color, and especially immigrants. And so we can kind of not notice that we're not paying them enough to, to, to raise their children. That's wrong. We need to fix that. And all the way up the chain of providers. When I first started working in a nursing home in 1978, I was told, why are you doing that? You're an American grad. If I was being told that I was doing third rate work, what were nurses being told? What were aides being told? This is valuable work. Why do we make it the dregs of payment and of respect? You know, there are TV shows about ER and, uh, you know, the heroes and all those sorts of things. There aren't TV shows about managing chronic illness. There aren't TV shows about living in a nursing home. There aren't TV shows about being a caregiver. Ronald Reagan got dementia. How much do we know after he you know, announced his dementia? Nothing. There had to be some serious issues there. There had to be some difficult terrain, even for somebody rich and influential. We don't know anything about it because we don't even talk about the problems of long-term care. It's either shameful or we just don't use language. But that family that rallies to take care of their father or mother, they're heroes. They ought to be in the kindergarten set of heroes along with policemen and firemen and, and your school crossing guard. But we don't even think that way because we don't even have the language. We don't have the stories. We don't have the shared public. I mean, every story about end of life care, well, there might be an exception, but rare exception. Every story about end of life care in the movies or on television has some dramatic closure, usually with a deliberate kill. This is not the way most of us end our lives. Most of us end our lives kind of quietly, kind of you know, drifting away. Why do we tell that story? We don't have even the language to tell the story. Gaithersburg or Montgomery County could learn to do it right. You could learn to move money and resources around. You could learn to measure how well you're doing, be able to show how well you're doing. You could be able to show that you're doing better in 2023 than you were in 2022. It could be the stuff of news. It could be the stuff of, of um, you know, being um, presented at meetings like this and at meetings of the city council. I think you could do it on the same amount of money we're using now. We just have to use it in some different ways, which requires some permissions and a whole lot of regulatory reform. But why aren't we going to CMS, the Medicare and Medicaid uh, Center, and saying we want to do a demonstration? We want, like 20 other places in the country, we want the freedom to do it right. We want to be able to show people the equivalent of the Toyota Revolution. Remember, the Toyota Revolution was that they ate GM's lunch by being able to produce a car that was more reliable, more efficient, and met people's needs better at a lower cost. We could do that in long-term care. We need a Toyota revolution in long-term care, and we need probably 20 or 30 communities in the country to really set out to do that in three years, not 10 years. Not, I mean, you'll keep going for 10 years or 20 years, but within three or four years, we need some examples that other places can rally to and say, yeah, we could do that. We could do that. That isn't so hard. We could do that. Because no one believes what's happening in Germany, Singapore, or Japan. It has to be homegrown. It has to show that it can work in America. The other thing we need is better financing. We are going to have twice as many people needing long-term care 
in less than 10 years. We have no plan to increase Medicaid that much. We have no way to get uh, resources to the people who are going to be in that group. Indeed, we are going to impoverish the next two generations. The largest growing group of caregivers now is the grandchildren of the people needing care. The grandchildren of the people needing care are being called into taking care of grandma because the middle generation has a better job. So the middle generation has a more reliable job and they say to the 22 year old, you know, you're having a problem getting a decent job. Just take a year and help us with grandma and, and then you can go back to you know, your life. And it ends up being four years or five years. And then this woman mostly ends up trying to start a career at 28 with a kid or two, and she's got every strike against her. We are impoverishing the next couple of generations in our inability to plan for caring for our own elder period. Now, it's reasonable that we got in this bind. In 1965, we just didn't have very much need to plan for the costs of long-term care. There just wasn't much. People didn't live that long. And when people did live that long, there wasn't any thought that it was medical. And families kind of took them in and did what they could. And every once in a while, they dumped them in the ER and they were a placement problem. But we didn't think that we had a lot to offer. We do have a lot to offer now. That matters. And it matters that most everybody in the room expects to live into your 80s and 90s, maybe even past 100. When I worked at the Washington Home in Washington, D.C., there were five people over 100. That was 3% of the total population in the country over 100 in one nursing home. Now, the average kid born today can expect to live to 100 if the trend continues as it has been. So we haven't had to build the social arrangements that make it plausible for people to plan for their own old age. We have almost no long-term care insurance, but long-term care insurance there is becomes increasingly expensive. It's mostly capped. At something like two years or $250,000 or something like that. If you have to buy it in your 60s, 70% of people won't qualify because they already have a condition that leads to underwriting. So long-term care insurance has become a very trivial part of the solution of how to finance an, uh, or, uh, long-term care. The major financing is actually Medicaid. But in order to get Medicaid, you have to have spent down to almost nothing and really impoverish yourself, your spouse, your family, lose your business, lose the family farm you know, or house or whatever else, whatever assets you had. Um, so that's not a terribly good solution, but what is it that a thoughtful person at 35 should be doing? Insurance isn't really available. They can't possibly save for the risks. It's like not having fire insurance. Would you actually own a home and not have fire insurance? Of course not. But there isn't fire insurance for long-term care. In fact, what you can buy is like the equivalent of having a small kitchen fire, but not one that burns the whole house down. You can't buy one for the 10-year long-term care. When I first started working in a nursing home, I picked up a resident uh, as a patient of mine who um, had had her stroke before I was born. The whole time I was growing up, getting trained, showing up as her doctor, she was living in that nursing home with a terrible stroke at 42. No one can save for that. And yet insurance isn't available. So, oh, the only thing that's available is Medicaid. So if you wanted to have most of the population being responsible for their own long-term care, we need to generate a way in which they could responsibly take care of themselves. Therefore, for the last two years, I've been working on a bill in Congress now called the WISH Act, which would provide catastrophic long-term care insurance on a social security type model for 0.6% uh, of your wages over your lifetime going into a trust fund, you would get insured for long, long-term care. 
Now, what does it exactly mean to have long, long-term care? Well, it's different for people who had different opportunities to save. So people who've been very poor all of their lives would only wait one year for this to kick in. People who've been middle income people would wait one year and 10 months. But people who earn more would go on up to Elon Musk having to wait five years. So the progressiveness of this is that you have, um, you, you, you contribute a percent of your wages through your lifetime. So people who earned a whole lot will actually be contributing more and that they will wait longer. This would generate a long-term care insurance market for the insurance companies to cover the waiting period in a prudent sort of way. If you've raised four daughters who love you dearly and all live within a block, you probably don't need a whole lot of insurance. It's assuming that they aren't estranged from you and that they love you dearly. Um, if on the other hand, you've never had any kids, and you're all alone in the world, you probably want to cover that period of time. So you could buy the insurance or save for the waiting period. You can estimate it pretty well by the time you're 45 or 55. And then you would have coverage for the upfront period. And then the Fed uh, would kick in as, as you got to the end of your waiting period. It would be a cash benefit $3,600 a month in the current array, which is just about enough to buy a PACE membership, um, program of all-inclusive care of the elderly. It's enough to buy about six hours of, of paid care. It's enough to support your daughter as she takes care of you. It's enough to fix the roof. It's enough to do whatever is a priority for you. Um, it's, there are many ways of putting it together. Uh, and, and I'm sure it would go through a lot of changes in the process of legislation. But it gives a goal. It gives an easy way to ask a politician, are you in favor of the WISH Act? And I want everyone here to prompt, and everyone online, to promise to start calling your representatives and asking what they're going to do about long-term care. We need to stop having this being a family tragedy and have it be a political issue. We have midterms coming up and there's every risk that we will kick this can down the road past the midterms, it won't be an issue. If everybody here called your two senators and your representative and your uh, county council member and your governor's office every month and asked, what are you doing about long-term care? About the 20th time they get called, they'll start having an answer. The first time they'll give the kind of modern kind of stuff that you know politicians give. Oh, we care terribly about the elderly. And yes, we've done this. And yes, we've done that. And isn't that lovely? And I'll pat myself on the back. And damn it, you're not doing enough. So we need to be calling these people and saying, I want you to have a plan. And I'm going to ask you about it at candidates forums. And I'm going to expect it to be in the newspapers. And about the 20th time they get that message, they'll start saying to a staff member, figure out what we can do in long-term care. And if you need something to crystallize it, say, are you in favor of the WISH Act, Federal Catastrophic Long-Term Care Insurance. And that would be you know, a something that they could say a yes or no to and begin to debate. Now, if you want more resources for that, just go to my website, drjoannlin.org. And there's kind of a guide for how to go about contacting at least the congressional people. Um, it's pretty easy to find how to contact the governor and the city council members and so forth. Um, but we have to make long-term care a political issue. It isn't just a personal issue. It isn't just a personal tragedy. It is the way we organized ourselves. The Washington Post had a story a few weeks ago saying that there were a substantial number of women who could not rejoin the workforce because of caregiving duties. For every one who was unable to rejoin the workforce because of childcare, there were four who could not rejoin the workforce because of care of an adult. That's because if you walk down the street here, you will see a dozen arrangements that make it plausible to raise children. Not easy, but plausible. Schools, buses, um, childcare, playgrounds. How many arrangements will you see to make it plausible to live in Montgomery County as an old person? You might sometimes see a curb cut. You'll eventually see a nursing home. That's it. 
So we need to change that because we've changed the demographics. We've changed our life expectancy. We've changed what we need to call our leadership to terms on. So how many here are ready to call your leadership every month? Ah, come on, everybody can do it. There you go. On Zoom, we can't take your poll, but do it too. It doesn't matter if you make mistakes. It doesn't matter if you say something dumb. It just matters that you make the leadership pay attention to this issue. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dr. Luke. That was uh, inspiring, challenging, thought-provoking, and I love that uh, we want to make Gaithersburg and Montgomery County a U.S. example. So, big challenge to everybody. We have a few minutes for questions. So, well, even before I finish that sentence, you are up. So, please. Uh, hi, I'm. Hold this down for a second. I'm Marla Lahat from Home Care Partners. Um, thank you so much. Your comments are right on target. I, I just want to add to that, that when you talk about wages for home care workers, it is so important, so very, very important. But in order to do that, the reimbursement to home care agencies through Medicaid, through Medicare, through county programs, it has to increase accordingly. Sure. Uh, I went through the expo just now. I didn't talk to every agency. I can't. You know, I can't speak for everyone. The ones I spoke to, they're all private duty agencies. They charge $30 an hour for an eight hour shift. Less than eight hours, you pay more. Does the county reimburse agencies that much? Does the state reimburse? No, they don't. So where are we to get the workers? Yeah, I mean, we need to put our minds together to figure that out. I mean, we need to get the workers for sure. And you know, at that $30 an hour, um, many people will spend out the Medicaid pretty quick. Um, you know, many elders do not have much reserve. So um, you know, we need to figure out how to pay people a decent wage. Now that $30 an hour is not going all to the aid. The aid is maybe getting half of it, maybe getting 15 or 20, maybe. Um, unless it's entirely private, not to an agency, but entirely private. Um, so, you know, we need to figure that out. It's a, it's, it's a challenge, but it's a workable challenge. You know, in 1910, the coal workers, I grew up in West Virginia, the coal workers were working at wages that did not provide support for them and their families. And when they unionized and went on strike and had a number of people killed and so forth, their wages doubled over about 15 years. We don't have an easy way to unionize um, you know, home care workers. Uh, it's hard to imagine going on strike, but there needs to be the same kind of sentiment that it is immoral and irresponsible to have large numbers of women who will arrive at their own retirement never having been able to accumulate any assets. That is not a way America should organize labor. Um, so, you know, this is labor that is valuable. This is labor that matters. Let's, let's pay for it. Let's figure out how to pay for it. Yeah. Hi, uh, I want to introduce myself. I, I'm Dada Lucci. I'm one of those politicians that you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I might put the wrong location, but this is a relatively new subject to me, but I want to ask you a comment. And very much for the very educational seminar. Um, it, just this past the legislative session, the Maryland legislature passed a bill that I sponsored to uh, exactly address this issue. Um, currently, as you said, you know, about 90% of the workforce is women or home care workers, and about 70% are minorities. And it is a super low paid uh, industry. Um, so for those companies that hire home care workers that receive a Medicaid funding to the state, my bill would require them to provide aggregate data about wages, about benefits, so that we can start having informed policies. You are exactly right, the, the, the reverse rate is too low, but the federal government requires states to submit that kind of data. 
in order to qualify for extra federal funding. Because without knowing how much people are paid and how much the gap is, we cannot uh, have meaningful conversations to address this issue. So it's an industry-wide issue, but those that are receiving state federal uh, state funding uh, are required to provide that data as a first step toward accountability and addressing that issue. So we are moving in that direction. And yes, please advocate so we can all be educated and then to support. Thank you. I am glad you did that. Um, one thing that Americans have not been willing to consider, but that you might, might very well consider here, is to have uh, the service provision be more geographic. You don't really need an eight hour minimum. You certainly don't need a three and a half hour minimum. What you need is the ability for the aid to move around among the people who are nearby. So when I was head of cancer and chronic disease for the public health office in Washington, DC, we had 62 home care agencies, every one of which had to serve every home in DC. So the Medicaid program might have a small apartment building with six people who needed home care, and they would have six different agencies, each one of which would require a three and a half hour minimum twice a day because people generally need help getting up and getting to bed. So it turned out that if you instead had one agency with two aides who moved around and helped their six people, you could double their wages and still come out ahead. And everybody in America says, oh, but wait a minute, it's competition that uh, ensures quality. Every study has shown that that is not true in home care. The, the competition, I mean, everybody charges almost the same. You know, uh, there's no competition on quality. So let's develop other ways of monitoring quality. Put granny cams in some of the homes and monitor what's happening. Make sure people are actually showing up. You know, you could, you could, there could be other ways of figuring out whether things are going right. But think of it like you would think about you know, water, sewer, cable TV, electricity. It's a community anchored service. And boy, can you get efficiencies. So can we think about that? Can we think about trying it out in just Gaithersburg for a while? You know, um, where people could walk down the street and take care of all six people in the community who need help, rather than spending half of their time sitting and watching the person because they have a three and a half hour minimum or driving from one place to another that's half an hour away. There were a couple other questions. Do we have time for a couple? Sure, we have a couple more. Go. In the back. I think <laughs> I came here to learn what is available to ordinary people for elderly care. In my experience of the uh, last few months, I was hospitalized. And I don't think there is a standard of service. I was there about a week in the hospital. I was not able to brush my teeth. I was not able to wash my face. No, I was not able to brush my hair. Only because the sink was never cleaned. I was afraid to use the toothbrush that they have provided on the sink, I will get more germs than I will give germs. There's no standard of care as far as I can see. And I watched YouTube where the nursing, the nurses were coming to private house and that particular YouTube program was the well-educated, he taught all over the country how to care. And he was 97 years old. And I could see his toenails. The toenails were grown so long. I don't see how you can walk. I don't, I think we should establish a standard of care, proper care. You don't get germs from where you are. 
They're afraid of the patient. If they are wearing masks, the shoes, and fancy clothes. And when they leave my room, they take off everything. And of course, I am unprotected. The patient is not protected, but they are protected. They are afraid of the patient. We have to have standards of care. There's no, if the patient is not protected, the, the person is there, <coughs> the caregiver is there, but not providing care. They are being paid, but not caring for the people. We have to have caring for them. I agree. Um, for those of you on Zoom, the, what the lady was saying is that there are multiple examples of very bad care, and we need to have ways to get at those and create standards and make sure that they're delivered. Uh, the fact that Medicare does not cover toenail care means a whole lot of people do not have toenail care. And the fact that you know, Medicare doesn't cover eyes and ears and teeth means a whole lot of people have those problems. And, you know, I'm not cleaning the sink, I just won't even touch. <laughs> one, one last question. One more question. Um, about five years ago, I applied for a WISH program, which was the Montgomery County Hospital Program, which was run by nurses uh, to aid people who were being discharged. And like the Swedish model, um, have services kind of coordinated. Um, I was under the impression in the last two years that that program was terminated. But that's an example of a very good program that doesn't really get promoted more. Um, and it could be extended into your model where it's not just people coming from the hospital, but say from an ER or from um, a place where they have gotten a diagnosis, but they need to have the follow-up care, uh, particularly if they don't have the resources um, to get around, etc. They need a lot of support at that time. So I would, uh, I would uh, present to the politicians that may or may not be here that we reinstitute this wish program. It could be a different name, so it doesn't <laughs> like wish back, but um, a program where people follow up. And this is the biggest problem that I see. There's really very discontinuous care in the United States as a rule. And anything that promotes continuum will be a better uh, situation. Very much agree. You need to get together with the lady with the standards and um, you know, create a standard that, that there is that kind of coordination. We need to both make care systems that don't need as much coordination because it's built in and we still need the coordination. Uh, you really should get to know PACE. It isn't in Montgomery County yet. There is a program in Baltimore and there's some new programs. There's one being built in Washington, DC. There's one in Fairfax. Um, but PACE is the program of all-inclusive care of the elderly. It is effectively available only to people who are in Medicaid and Medicare. Medicaid and Medicare each give the program a capitation each month. Once you're in PACE, PACE is with you to the end of your life in all settings. And the PACE program helps manage not going into the hospital so much. The PACE program manages not going into a nursing home so much. PACE program manages helping your caregivers get support because they have a capitated amount and they're using it to take care of a particular population. In the pandemic, the PACE programs nationwide did the most remarkable things. They mobilized services to the home. They changed transportation vans into refrigerator trucks to deliver food. They um, bought hotel rooms at times so that uh, people who needed just overnight place to stay after a hospitalization had a place. 
They converted their day centers in some cases into essentially sort of infirmaries for people who were getting close to the end of life and didn't have enough support otherwise. Just an amazing array because they were booked for life. They could not duck. Every doctor could duck. Every hospital could duck. Pace could not duck. Pace had these people. They had to figure out how to take care of them. And boy, did they do one bang up job. It looks like they had about a quarter as much um, COVID um, as people, these were all nursing home eligible people, as people in nursing homes. Um, they managed the COVID so much better. Uh, it was just truly remarkable. It is not available to your senior gap population because of a screwball way that Medicare interpreted Part D, the pharmaceutical coverage. So your pharmaceutical coverage goes from what you think is $50 a month to $1,200 a month when you go into PACE as a person who is not yet in Medicaid. That is not necessary. There are ways around that, but nobody has pushed the government enough to fix it. But if people in your senior gap could go into a PACE program and you had one or two or three PACE programs in Montgomery County, things would be so much different. Um, so get to know PACE, demand that it show up in your county. For a long time, Maryland would only allow the one program um, um, in Bayview and uh, Baltimore. Now they've opened it up to small numbers each year. So get Montgomery County in line for PACE programs. That's a way in which you get the coordination and you get the coordination at every step. Now you have to be nursing home eligible to get into PACE. So there's a lot of suffering on the way to getting that disabled. But, um, but at least once, that, once you're that disabled, PACE is a really bang up program. So I suppose we should quit and let people have a break. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome back everybody. I'm David Engel. I'm a commissioner at the Commission on Aging. We have three great panel speakers for this session. I'm gonna introduce them. We're gonna give them the opportunity to present and then we'll take your questions at that time. Uh, after that, we'll take a, a quick lunch break or a long lunch break uh, and then come back for an afternoon session. We welcome everybody back for that session. We have three more great speakers for the afternoon. Uh, we have with us today, Joan Ikabina, a successful entrepreneur and coach with a diverse professional background in banking, finance, IT, and nursing. Most notably, Joan has served as CEO of her company for the past 20 years in healthcare and advocating on TV for the elderly. As a member of the Home Care Association of America and the Grassroots Organization for the Well-Being of Seniors, Joan has been influential in bringing to light challenges faced by home care providers in the county and the state level. She has advocated for policy changes to promote the well-being of seniors. While working as a nurse for in-home care agencies, she saw the need to bring a different experience to home care employees, especially caregivers. That insight gave rise to her start to start her home care agency under Visiting Angels. Joan's passions for passion for excellence has earned her Governor Hogan's citation and appreciation of outstanding services and integrity. Visiting Angels Award of Best of Home Care Employer of Choice 2022 is the direct result of her company's philosophy that a happy employee makes a happy client. Thank you, Joan, for being here. Dr. Kimberly Johnson is a licensed clinical social worker and an approved social work supervisor for the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in the state of Maryland with almost 20 years of social work experience. Dr. Johnson earned her PhD in social work at Morgan State University, Master of Social Work at the University of Maryland and a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Copen State College. Dr. Johnson previously served as a home care supervisor and is currently a manager for the Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services Adult Services Programs, where she provides clinical, fiscal, and administrative oversight. She is also a trainer and educator. Dr. Johnson is a contributing author in the book chapter entitled City Life, What a Wonderful Way of Life, Aging in the Urban Environment. Thank you for being here. 
Robin Stone, Doctor of Public Health, Senior Vice President for Research at Leading Age and Co-Director of the Leading Age Long-Term Support and Services Center at UMass Boston. She's a noted researcher and internationally recognized authority on long-term care, aging services, and workforce policy. She has been engaged in policy development, program evaluation, large-scale demonstrations, and other applied research activities in these areas for over 40 years. Dr. Stone has held senior research and policy positions in both the federal government and the private sector, including serving in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Disability Aging and Long-Term Care Policy and Assistant Secretary for Aging in the Clinton Administration. Her work bridges the worlds of research policy and practice to improve the care delivered to older adults, particularly lower income populations and to ensure best quality of life for these individuals and fit their families. We're very happy to have you all here with us today. Uh, we're gonna start off with Joan, we're gonna give her the opportunity to share her screen and talk to us a little bit about income care. Thank you, David. And uh, I'd like to start off by saying a big thank you to Dr. Lin for setting the tone for the talk today. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. And also to thank the Commission on Aging for inviting me to be part of the um, presentation, the panelists today. So I am talking about in-home care, okay? But because of the sake of time, I created a few slides. I will not go through every point. So starting out with home care, what is home care? Some of you already are familiar with what home care is, but for the benefit of those who are not, we're referring to support services that are typically provided by a professional. We, we usually refer to them as caregivers, okay? These support services are non-medical in nature. And I am gonna emphasize that for today's talk, we're gonna focus on the non-medical in home care because there's a difference and sometimes people get confused between in-home care and home health care. So moving right along to the next slide, let's look at the differences between in-home care and home health care. Get this out of the way. So the objective of in-home care is to help those who choose to remain at home or want to age in place to remain independent and safe in their home, place of familiar, uh, fam their familiar surroundings. And these services will be activities of daily living, which we'll go into the next um, point there, and, and um, instrumental activities of daily living called IEDLs. On the other hand, the home health care, and I think the difference there is the health, is to provide short-term physician-directed care usually to help individuals recover from an illness or injury, or maybe they're coming back from home um, or from a rehab facility. The services that are provided in home care are non-medical, like I mentioned earlier, custodial care, such as hygiene assistance, bathing assistance, dressing, grooming, um, meal preparation, laundry, light housekeeping, companionship, safety supervision. And on the home health care side, we are talking medical skilled care that will normally be provided by um, an RN. These are skilled nursing care, physical therapy, OT, speech therapy, wound care, IV, you name it. So I'm, I hope we get the difference so far. Now, the skill set for the personnel that provide the care for in-home care you normally have non-licensed, but that means they are certified. They are not licensed, but they are certified as certified nursing assistants. We normally call them CNAs, geriatric nursing assistants. We refer to them as GNAs, HHAs, home health aides, and companions. I mentioned companions, and I'll show you in the next slide because there's a difference also when it comes to um, personal care and companion care. But for home health, you are talking about your licensed personnel who are registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, 
respiratory therapies and the like. How do we pay for these services? I know there's been a lot already about paying for services and the challenges that um, families and seniors are facing in our community. For in-home care, it's usually out of pocket, private pay, self-pay, or long-term care insurance. Dr. Lin mentioned that earlier. But some may qualify, and I put them maybe Medicaid because you have to qualify for Medicaid. For the home health care, Medicare, again, this is the care, Medicare would cover private insurance, some private insurance would cover, and then maybe Medicaid also, okay? And um, how do we, what is the eligibility for insurance? For the in-home care, you have to be eligible for Medicaid, and for the home health care, you have to be eligible for Medicare, and it has to be ordered by a physician, okay? So let's take a look at the differences between companion care and personal care. So these two are in under in-home care, the non-medical side. I wanna emphasize because sometimes when some um, clients call or potential clients call us, they're asking, how do I pay for you know, my services? Is it cheaper for companion care or is it more expensive for personal care? So I like to emphasize that there's a difference, okay? Some agencies do not charge um, differently for their services, they just have one rate. So for companion care, we're looking at the IADLs, like light housekeeping, companionship, shopping, meal preparation, errands, shopping, transportation, anything that does not involve touching the care recipient, okay? With the personal care, we're now going into touching the care recipient, providing the bathing, dressing, grooming, feeding, toileting, even medication reminders are now considered personal care, working and transferring. Moving right along, now that we know the difference between in-home care and home health care, the difference between companion care and personal care, what are some warning signs that we can you know, identify to know that our loved one may be in need of in-home care, okay? You can take some screenshots for those who are online, those who are here, you can take photos of the um, projector because I may not have enough time to go through all of them. But <laughs> yeah, so once you notice some of these in your loved ones, you wanna start thinking. Don't wait, start thinking, start doing your homework, start calling the county um, department of aging, start calling some agencies, start going to the library, start reading up on what is available for you. Because before you know it, it may be too late and you are in panic. So some of the things that you want to be looking out for, has your loved one posed a threat to their own well-being? Have they experienced lapsing, lapses in memory? Are they unable to maintain an independent lifestyle? Are they having any physical limitations? Unable to prepare their own meals? Unable to make it through the night unattended? Sometimes they may be calling you to help them to the bathroom or they've been recently discharged from a hospital, a rehab center, and it may be getting to the point where this is beginning to disrupt your own personal schedule, and you may be unsatisfied with your own caregiving efforts. Let's face it, you wanna be a daughter, a son, or um, the niece, or you know the point of contact, the POA, and you may not have the skill set to do what it takes to be a caregiver. And um, I have my card telling me my time is almost up, so I'll wrap this up very quick. But I wanted to share with us today some tips on talking to our loved ones, okay? If you identify any of those 10 points, how do you begin the conversation with them? Because sometimes they may be resistant to care. And you may be having a guilt trip. Oh, I have to take care of mom, but I have to work. In our office, our visiting angels, we say the sandwich generation. 
you have your children to take care of, you have mom to take care of, and all the other things in between, and yourself to take care of for that matter. So you want to start and make sure that your loved one is the focus of all discussions. Talk to them in person. It may be challenging for those who are out of state, but it is worth it to make the trip to your loved one and have a face-to-face -face conversation. Listen, be respectful of others' opinions, especially your loved ones. Don't overwhelm them with reports, statistics, and forms. As you gather the literature from all the agencies in the area from the county, it may be too confusing for them. Just go with the flow. Be patient. It may take more than one conversation. And don't assume it's going to be easy. Sometimes you may be lucky it will be easy, but sometimes it may be an uphill battle. So just be prepared. <laughs> um, and then you may get to the point where you need to involve others, like physicians, clergy, um, maybe a geriatric care professional or a home care agency. Don't be shy to do so. They would be able to give you resources to help you carry out that conversation or you know, um, discuss further and help you make the right choice for your loved one and yourself. And then plan to follow up if necessary. I hope this has been beneficial. Thank you so much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Good morning. Again, my name is Kimberly Johnson, and my um, chief, Dr. Bill Brunel, has already been acknowledged, but I would like to acknowledge really quickly my direct administrator, uh, Mario Rosarson, who is sitting in the front. And so I am here today to, and thank you to the Commission on Aging for asking me to be a presenter. And I am here today to discuss the county's in-home aid services program, also referred to as the home care program. So what is the home care program? The home care program provides personal care services in the homes to eligible clients. The program provides personal care services to seniors and adults with disabilities who are, who are unable to manage independently due to physical and or cognitive challenges around thinking, judging, or comprehension. Some of those specific personal care services include as Joan already I've talked about, assisting the client with bathing activities, dressing and undressing, grooming activities, helping to perform oral hygiene procedures, helping with eating, meal prep, assisting with ambulating, transferring from bed to wheelchair or chair, carrying out prescribed exercise routines under the direction of a nurse, prompting the client to take his or her own prescribed medication. So who do we provide these personal care services to? We provide these services to adults with disabilities who need assistance, those who are vulnerable adults at risk of abuse or neglect. So what is our capacity to serve? Our capacity is we provide services based on staff and availability within the home care industry and within DHS, and of course, availability of funding. So how do you get into um, the home care program? So entry into the program. Sorry, should I start over? <laughs> so entry into the program. So a referral source, and the referral source can be anyone calling on behalf of a client. It can be the client calling themselves. So they call our Aging and Disability Resource Unit and is referred then to our intake and assessment foot screening. The intake worker does a phone interview with a referral source and is placed on a social service to adults wait list for an assessment, which includes in-home aid services. The client is assigned a social worker who will conduct a face-to-face -face assessment and determine if the client is eligible and appropriate for in-home aid services. If determined eligible and appropriate, then the referral is made to the in-home aid services program by the social worker. The IHOS program with in-home aid services program staff makes a referral to the contractor, which could be visiting angels, one of our other um, contract agencies, to initiate services. However, if an adult protective service emergency exists for a client, service are provided the same day. 
So what are the goals really of the home care program? The goals are to foster independence and to promote self-determination, to promote a safe environment, to prevent or remedy abuse, neglect, self-neglect, or exploitation of vulnerable adults, to, produce, to prevent or reduce the number of hospitalization or institutionalization. The IHAS program does provide tour services. The IHAS program population are more vulnerable groups and has come to the attention of the department because of being at risk of abuse and neglect. So many of our clients, we offer tour services in addition to personal care services. Many of our clients who start out with tour services oftentimes end up needing personal care services. Um, I continue to be pessimistically optimistic that we are going to see changes uh, in this country and in the state, uh, having been in this for well, quite a long time. And uh, interestingly enough, one of my colleagues from over 30 years ago, Roseanne, uh, Roseanne Coffey and I worked together at what is now the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And um, I did one of the first studies for on family caregiving in the United States probably was the first study of national data on looking at family caregiving it was the 1982 long-term services and support study. Um, and guess what? Fast forward to 2022, same proportion of care is being delivered in the United States. So I think it's really important for, for us to understand that almost all in-home care is provided by families. That has not changed. It's between 80 and 95% of all the services that are delivered are delivered by unpaid, mostly women, mostly spouses, wives, and adult daughters. So um, this is the standard of long-term care in the United States. Um, I don't see it changing anytime soon. And actually, quite honestly, there are some extreme benefits to having family caregiving as a bulwark as an underpinning of our system. However, <laughs> we need to think about how we support older adults, younger people with disabilities, and their family members in doing this job. Because as Joanne was saying, we've just gotten the tip of the iceberg of baby boomers aging. I'm, she's 70, I'm 72. I've been in this since I was 26 years old. And uh, now with gray hair, I'm actually looking at it in the mirror and recognizing that I used to talk about it and now I'm actually living it. And um, when we talk about in-home care, which is the purpose of this commission meeting, it's wonderful to have the aspiration of remaining in your home for as long as possible until you die. However, in order to actually make that happen, we need a couple of things. One is we actually need shelter. You need a home. You need a home in order to actually remain in the community. Um, many people these days, we have the last generation of fully paid for mortgages in this country. Older adults right now are the, are the population in the United States that is the greatest homeowners to buy our homes. And we also had a lot of incentives from the federal government, including mortgage, mortgage deductions and a lot of other things to help us buy and keep those homes, especially if we were white. And in addition to that, we actually were encouraged to think of our home as an asset. So this generation of older adults is more likely than any other, particularly white elderly, which is, by the way, has been historically about 80% of all older adults are white. Um, they are wealthier than any previous generation. They are living longer than any previous generation. And they have had more assets because they have assets in their home. That is changing rapidly. <laughs> We are, seeing, we are starting to see a reversal in these homeowner, homeownership patterns, which by the way, have never been seen at the same levels for, for people of color or lower income individuals, which is where most of my work is done. But we're also seeing even among middle-class older adults, younger old, where they are not paying their homes out right. 
When they do, they have unbelievable property taxes and expenses on their homes, which were built sometimes, if you're living in a rural community or in some of the older neighborhoods, may have been built 100 years ago, not up to standard code, certainly not um, universal design like Joanne talked about in Singapore. And I have spent time in Singapore and can tell you that's a very different situation there. And there are real challenges to people remaining in their own homes, just the suburban split level that we bought in 1961 with all of those steps are now really not uh, viable for many folks to age in place or to successfully age in community. So I think one of the things that is really important in thinking about in-home care is the role of housing. And what does Montgomery County need to do about this? both in terms of helping people who are living in their own homes. And you have a lot of suburban living here in Montgomery County, up county, but even down county, Silver Spring. Uh, these homes are not viable for an in-home strategy. So what are we doing around universal design, at least for new construction and for old construction, what is the investment that we are making in home modifications adaptations and the other things that are going to allow folks to remain in their communities, particularly for middle income and low income folks. Um, what I have seen in most communities is a drop in the bucket relative to what is needed for particularly this gap population. And then for lower income, we have affordable housing where every single one of our subsidized rent subsidized housing properties has a waiting list of over 2000 people. So this is not tenable. And when Joanne made the hyperbol hyperbolic statement that we might be seeing people living in the streets, the fastest growing group of homeless in the United States are older adults. So I think the housing piece of this is a serious part of in-home services. Then we get to the services themselves. And um, one of the things that my group has been working on for years now, and I started my first First work was in, 19, in 1989 when we started to do some work around the frontline care professionals, is that we are now in a serious crisis, particularly post-COVID, but this was always a challenge in terms of recruiting and retaining a frontline workforce that I call care professionals being paid low wages. These are not low wage workers, <laughs> they're actually professionals. And I think when you looked at the list of non-medical care, that you may look at that and say, oh, anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. These are extremely high competency jobs. Toileting, I just spent two hours with a researcher yesterday on the phone about toileting and how are we gonna improve that in this country? Because incontinence and mobility issues together are a serious challenge to, to keeping people and particularly women, older women remaining healthy and safe in the community. All of these tasks are extremely seriously require competencies, not to mention the behavioral and emotional pieces of these jobs. Large proportion of folks in, in the community who are receiving care are people with dementia or at least some level of cognitive impairment. So these are not easy, unskilled jobs. These are extremely highly competent jobs that are paid low wages. So right now we're in the middle of a crisis. So even if you wanted to deliver services, you can't find a staff person. And I hear this in the private duty nursing, people who are looking for people, just neighbors, and also from uh, home health agencies. This is a serious challenge for us. We've got to do something in Montgomery County uh, immediately about recruiting, creating uh, new ways of thinking about how we're gonna get people into this sector I don't think it's just with bonus payments. <laughs> I actually think we have to have coalitions of consumers, workers, providers, hospitals. We all have to be working together to actually create a workforce. What's happening now, and I've only got two minutes to say this, but we have hospitals that are poaching our staff and that is, or we have nursing homes poaching home care, or we have an agency poaching another, or we have a staffing agency that's charging $30 to, to get a, a, AIDS into the home. We need to all come together to say this is enough, and we're gonna create a new pool of 
workforce dollars to actually support the investment of work staff who can be trained across settings from hospital to home care, where we are no longer competing, but we actually are rationing and using our resources in a much better way to understand how we actually get these folks in, into these various settings to work, including, by the way, the idea that Joanne brought up, which is what we call cluster care, which is to say you don't need an aide in a home sitting there for four hours if they don't need to be there for four hours. We need to be distributing this workforce in a way that meets the needs of the population. And so that's something that you can do at a county level. It's much harder to do this at a state level, but at a county level, we should be able to get the data to be able to redistribute these resources so that we begin to create a pool, attract a pool of workers. We need to think about potentially local levies or ways of, of bringing in some new tax dollars in the county to raise these wages up to a living wage. Because right now we're competing with every Amazon, every Walmart, every other job, including the hospitals. The only way to solve this, and my time's up, is for the county to all come together. And I would just recommend these two areas. One is working on this workforce crisis, which becomes an economic driver because these people then begin to pay taxes. They support the county. They bring revenue into the county. It's not just for the staff people, it's for the entire economy. And then the second thing is to think about the housing, the structure of our housing, the investment in affordable, and how do we help people who live in suburban and, and particularly housing that is no longer amenable to service delivery, how do we make it amenable to service delivery? And I'll stop there. Thank you. So that was a lot to unpack. <laughs> And we would welcome questions from the audience. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Marla. Sorry. You could stand up. Yeah, Marla Wahab from Home Care Partners, and we're one of the providers on the program that Dr. Johnson mentioned. And I look forward to talking to you more about the reimbursement. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. You know, we're receiving, but I, I, again, I don't really have a question, just comments. Um, I loved hearing all the presentations. And always like hearing how uh, Malcolm Stone speak. Um, I do want to just add to what has been said. The, these are very skilled workers we're talking about. Um, they go through training, they go through continuing education, they have to be assessed for their competency, and not only are they not getting enough money to live on and not paying the taxes, they're using the same resources. Yeah. So those same workers are qualifying for Medicaid yeah. and other subsidized services because they're not getting enough money. Um, but to add to the Coaching issue, which is really it's one way of saying it, but we're all competing for the same very limited pool. But what we also have going on in this area is that a CNA from Maryland cannot work in DC yeah. in home care. A DC home health aide can't go right across the line to Montgomery County where they may live to work in Montgomery County. And we need to look at this both at the council level, but regionally as well. That's a great point. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Vice President. Anybody else have a yes, Senator? Hi, thank you so, all so much. I've learned so much. Uh, Dr. Johnson, yes. the services that you talked about, are there any guidelines? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? The services that you were discussing, are there income guidelines that would be eligible for? There, them? there are asset guidelines. Mm -hmm. Um, so there may be a small fee based on income, but it's asset based. I see. Mm -hmm. I see. So if, if you're over such and such an asset level, you won't. Yes, be that is correct. Mm -hmm. Dr. Stone, and, and I may be completely not remembering this correctly, but wasn't there some kind of uh, labor shortage in like Maine or someplace on the They had something you know, like crisis. I might have been there's a labor shortage right now. There's a labor shortage everywhere. I mean, Maine is a particularly problematic state because it's it's now the actually the oldest state 
and it also is very rural. And, and Montgomery County actually, interestingly enough, is also has significant rural pockets even within this county. So and rural issues are even more significant. So, you know, as we, I mean, the thing that I, that I find so interesting is that there is this um, flurry of love for in-home care, and yet there's no infrastructure or real support to think about what it would take to make this really happen normatively. Um, you know, nursing homes are still an entitlement in, in Medicaid. Home care is not. So waivers and personal care options are the only way that we get dollars from Medicaid into this. You, you may have older Americans Act dollars and you may have some state money in this, but these are for people who qualify. And in this case, we're talking about an asset, asset qualification. For those folks above those levels, there's absolutely nothing available until you're wealthy enough to either self-insure or you may have bought long-term care insurance, which for most people is a complete ripoff. So um, I, you know, I, I think that that um, what Maine has done and what all of us, that we're all talking about the same things. It's just a matter of magnitude. And that is that, that we have to figure out another way other than the kind of competition that we're seeing right now to create incentives for people to be working in these jobs. And that's going to be a combination of higher pay, career opportunities, value to begin with, that these are highly skilled jobs and not well-waged worker jobs, uh, career advancement opportunities for folks to have pathways for um, more, more opportunity. And then we have to think about how we create incentives for what I think has to be a redistribution of some of these resources so that our sector is not always the what I call the bastard child, even of the healthcare sector. The same thing happened with with um, with with COVID. Home care was the last place that got PPE or any investment in any of the, of. And we're lucky that we didn't have more people die. And quite honestly, I'm not sure we even know because we don't collect the same great data that we've gotten out of the nursing home to even know what happened to people living in the community. But we have to be on that front line of people understanding these jobs these are jobs economic, are economic drivers. drivers. They could, they be, could be creating, creating revenue, revenue streams. streams. We did a paper on living wage and the amount of money, if we paid every aid a living wage in 2022, we would be raising billions of dollars in this country through taxes, revenue generation because lower wage people actually spend more in their communities than higher wage people do. So we have to understand this is not just a moral thing to do, it's actually an economic thing to do. And we have to get people to understand that these are viable jobs, including the facts, folks we wanna attract, and then making sure that we, are, we distribute these jobs in a way that we're not losing it to the other parts of the healthcare sector. And that I think is gonna be critical in terms of the, the kinds of things that Visiting Angels are doing. I love those ads on TV, by the way. And what your program is doing, you can't even have the program if we don't have warm bodies and we don't want a warm body. We want quality people that are retained. Every time you keep a worker, you save at least four to $5,000 which is money saved from Medicaid. And if we can get these folks off of public benefits, we're gonna save in that area too. So I think the combination of that and then making sure that the housing is either sufficient to support services coming in, that we think about economies of scale in naturally occurring reti retirement communities where we may have a lot of older people living together, redistribute those, the services in a way that makes sense and then thinking about the affordable housing for folks who actually are going to need it. So to me, those are the biggest things for, for this population. Can I just um, ask you one last thing? And, and all the conversation I've heard today assumes that caregivers are working for organizations. So I'm from West Virginia, not far from yeah. where about the wind. And my sister and my parents both have, have caregivers. And unfortunately, 
they rely on friends of yeah. friends, know somebody who, who could work, you know, under the table, yeah. pay them under the table. Yeah. How many of how many caregivers are actually not trained, but they're just somebody who can't get a job in a place else, mm-hmm. and they're a friend of a friend and recommend, you know, and they're getting paid ten dollars an hour under yeah. the table, yeah. no mm-hmm. social security, nothing. Yeah. How, we, how much of that? We don't know the estimates of the shadow economy. We're actually trying to get some better data on that. But one thing I can tell you is, and Maryland does not have a very strong consumer directed program. Other states are um, actually have programs where either through Medicaid or through state funded dollars, you actually can directly hire independent providers so that you are at least setting some standards for the, having a fiscal intermediary to ensure that these folks are getting social security paid for and those kinds of things. But you're absolutely right. We've got an incredible shadow economy. And unless we start to set some standards, that's the only way that this is gonna work. Um, we have to have a society that is committed also to not paying the cheapest labor. And, and, and that's really hard for a, a, a modest income person. So the conundrum is we have to come together in this, in this sense in, as a county to say, what can we do together? That's why I would like to see t- discussion. And we've had some discussion with, one, with the delegate who I don't see her here anymore, but David Rodwin and I have actually had some discussion with her um, about thinking about how we get county dollars to start to support modest and middle income, the gap population. We've seen counties raise levies in very conservative counties that wouldn't have paid for anything because they actually understand this is the needs of their community. So we need to at least have the discussion. Nobody ever wants to say the T word or whatever, but we need new money in in addition to redistribution of the money that we've already got to make this happen. Yes. Can you stand up, please? I'm here at the Lansing. I'm Michael, money manager. I'm a daily money manager. I help people who can afford to pay me with their money. And unfortunately, I've taken care of many um, seniors in our community who think they have money, but it's all gone because no one stopped to figure out if they could afford their home health aid. Yeah. And the million dollars that they thought they had is not gone there. Four years. And they don't, they, and there they are. Um, so even before someone gets to that, so first of all, I have like an ethical issue with home care companies who aren't checking, sorry to my peers, about as to whether people can really afford their services, but also for people who can afford it, but maybe not 24-7, they can afford it. Mm-hmm. How are they going to afford it if wages increase? That's kind of like I agree. They can't afford it themselves. Mm-hmm. They they cannot afford it themselves, which is why I say this. I mean, if Joanne were here, she would say the same thing. I mean, we're living in a la la land if we think we can continue. I don't know how long we can continue the way we continue. I've been struck by the fact that we've been able to continue as much as we have, and it's because of family caregivers that are able to make that work, but they can't afford it. So we either have to do something at the federal level, which we've never been able to do, which is to get some type of social long-term care insurance through, or we need to do it at a state level, which the only state that's had social insurance for long-term care is Washington, and they're having problems with that. Or we have to start to talk about the county level of where do we think about beginning to bring in new dollars that would help to support even middle-income people who could spend down very, very quickly and also think about more judiciously how we use the resources of an aid. The whole system is not is is built on complete fragmentation at every single step of the way. And after many years of doing federal policy and a lot of research, I'm convinced that local is where it's at, which is why I think these county discussions are so critical, and even city discussions of what Gaithersburg might do. 
um, because it all cannot be solved at other levels. And public policy has got to play a role in this because we don't save enough in this country. We're not savers. And we've been talking about saving for as long as I've been working in this. And I was 26 years old. Most people, if you look at the average adult, older adult dollars that they have in their savings account, it's something like maybe, maybe $25,000, $30,000. And these are just, these are middle income people. Now they ha- may have an asset in their home. And the other thing I think we need to think about for people who have assets in their home is we need a new way of thinking about, about a reverse annuity mortgage because those are horrible products. But if we could figure out how to get some of those dollars out of people's as- assets in their home, maybe that provides resources. We have to start to think about those resources. I completely agree with you. They cannot afford it. And especially if we're going to live to 100. I mean, please, I was just at a longevity meeting in London where they're talking about 120. Uh, Before we get to the next question, we'll get to your question. Joan, would you like to respond to the question on how people are affording care and what the, and also how are they finding private care? Thank you for um, bringing up the concern there. Um, sorry, I didn't catch your name. And um, with visiting angels, when we go out, we do an initial consultation where we tell you what our services are, our protocols, and all of that. Now, how can you afford the services? Usually, it's private pay. Mm-hmm. Okay? And if you let us know that you cannot afford based on your needs, and the level that we, you know, uh, our rates, we turn you over to the county. We turn you over to the county, we turn you over to respite services, we turn you over to other resources that are available to help you because many times people are not aware. They are not aware. But starting from the county, I think it's a 3,000 number, Yeah, you can get a lot of resources. So we don't just leave them high and dry. We also work with almost all the long-term care insurance. I know a lot has been said about that. But many of them still have, you know, um, policies that will pay for a substantial amount, although they have their daily limits, but they will cover a substantial amount of care. And of course, we have to come up with creative means to make sure that we can afford care. I know around the county, it used to be four hour minimum. Many agencies are now up to eight hours. Yeah, now, that's crazy. Now, who can afford that Nobody. at the current rates? Okay, so we find situations where we may have to tag on private pay and respite care Mm -hmm. just to make sure that we can afford um, the services. It is a challenge, but I hope with all the discussions here today, some solution will come down the road. Laurie, you had a question? I just wanted to see whether somebody in the audience has any questions changes that I understand might be coming down the road with Medicare Advantage and some of the openings uh, dangling uh, with regard to uh, some of the expanded benefits. So your, your question is just for the people on Zoom, is Medicare Advantage going to be paying for in-home care? Mm-hmm. Yes. And some of, yeah, some of the expanded benefits that are associated with Medicare Advantage. I mean, there is a there. There are definitely openings uh, that the CMS and Medicare Advantage plans have expanded their social determinants of health benefit options, including personal care to a certain extent. When you look at what the plans are offering right now, it is extremely limited, and it depends on the plan that you are in. On the other hand, I think that um, we have an opportunity to think about this for people who are in Medicare Advantage and to have some advocacy around how we make this happen in a way that works for people and not for just the plans, because they are concerned about, obviously, their costs. And we have to demonstrate, there's been work done to demonstrate the effects of actually having this in-home care services, saving money for Medicare itself and for the plans as well. So the more that they begin to see that these services are not only just add-ons, but actually have, are, are good for them, 
I think you're going to see an expansion. And I don't know how much if you've used any of those benefits through with any advantage plans. I'd like to add to what you just said. So for the Medicare Advantage um, plans, they can cover for in-home care. The challenge though is the reimbursement rate is very low. Yeah. It's not just they don't want to pay. I mean, I mean, as of last year, I think there were twins and uh, twins. Now we are looking, I'm sorry. 2055. There you go, 2055. Yeah. Montgomery County minimum is right now 30. So how do you engage such a program when you're paying your caregivers anywhere from 17 to 20 dollars an hour? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a real, I, I think the theory behind this is, is a good one in terms of what we call the camel's nose under the tent. The other thing is for people who don't know, you have to be enrolled in Medicare Advantage. So about, Joyce, about 40% of the older adult population now is enrolled in a managed care plan. That means 60% of our older adults are still in fee for service. And Medicare fee for service does not cover personal care or any of these other companion services. So this would own, this is right now only available for people who are in a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, but I do think it is the beginning of a discussion of expansion, of thinking about expansion of these types of services. The devil's always in the details. And you know, that's where advocacy comes in. I would like to direct a question to Dr. Johnson about how we might find out more about in-home aid services and where does someone start yeah. to determine whether they're eligible and can get care from that. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the question. You can start with our Aging Disability Resource Unit and the young, all right, say the number 240-777-3000. I do have some brochures on the table. I have some of my business cards on the table. So if you don't get an opportunity to ask your question today, you can always reach out to me. My email is on my business card as well. That's great. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there a task force to tackle this on a county level that you know of? Um, I will ask Chair of the Commission on Aging, Barbara Seltzer, to address that question. Just as you're the county executive um, convened a workforce bringing together um, the business community providers, um, Montgomery County Public Schools, the um, Montgomery College, um, various county agencies, and a number of other interested stakeholders on a task force for in-home and community-based workforce. And this task force is focused on the issue of how do we get sufficient workforce for direct care workers in Montgomery County. So I'm very anxiously awaiting um, the outcome of that task force. And uh, I would look to Bob that if she has any advice that she'd like to provide as an input to that task force. Thank you. Oh, right now. <laughs> uh, good luck. Good. Good luck. <laughs> you know. Sir, is that to stand up for the home against all laws and uh, this is an interested party? And you brought up about uh, uh, cluster, <laughs> and you talked about having caregivers who are spending time at home where those hours aren't put to good use. Mm -hmm. Thinking there's one piece of this, and we talk about smart homes, mm -hmm. and we talk about you know, the issue of housing, mm -hmm. but the technological infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We're all using phones. Mm -hmm. right. We're not connecting. Mm -hmm. We could say, for instance, um, Alexa. Mm -hmm. We have to make it as easy as possible. But we don't think about clustering those Alexa in small communities. So my neighbor could simply say, I'll call, are you available? I could say yes or no. I could say, oh, does anybody in this cluster want to play bridge today? Um, we've got some folks, did anybody hear about this particular issue or not? But in this small cluster, they're connected and they need facilitation. But what we're talking about is a way to think about how does technology facilitate a group or a clustered approach as opposed to looking at them individually as individual homes, individual caregivers, 
And I don't hear enough of the conversation about how do we bring in current technologies I to think it's a great point. working together in a more efficient way. I, I think it's a great point. Typically what you hear is just technology as a gadget or as its own entity to solve a problem as opposed to the more ubiquitous use of current technologies like the smartphone that if we could be connected, there's a lot of things that could make even a in home services much more efficient themselves in terms of the kind of cluster care that we're talking about. Not to mention the connectivity with neighbors and others to provide ancillary support. So I agree that the problem with the technology discussion is it's mostly run by technology people. <laughs> and so they are looking for their own solutions, which is they're trying to solve a product as opposed to thinking about how it gets integrated into the community. And I think it's a, it's a perfect example of where we've got room for that and we haven't had great discussions about it. So thank you for raising that. Anyone that's the online today? Well, I can wait. Just one follow-up. Is there a way, and perhaps you can help me, how do we get that into the conversation and really think about how to, within a task force, Think about a repurposing. It should of be in. It should be in the task force discussions. I mean, it is definitely a piece of this. You don't need a smartphone that has every single gadget in there to make something like this happen. So, one of all, we have um, Yeah, I'd like to take that question. I thought um, early on in the pandemic, um, one of the things that the county did, we partnered with the state. And um, we're giving um, Echo Show Gates, which is an Amazon device. Um, so, what we did was distribute those um, Echo Show Gates um, to clients, to um, anyone that would take it um, to help reduce social, social isolation, to connect with their family members who were made in another state, to connect with their providers, um, family members, you know, in the same area. Um, so that's something that we are looking at at the county. Um, our clients, you know, have a back to it. Um, one of the challenges that we do have with it is the setup of the devices. Um, right now, we use our social workers to do that. So we're trying to look at some partnerships with students, some of these maybe local colleges, volunteers to be able to set up those devices. But our clients have been able to utilize those devices and have their communication with their family members, listen to music, um, just a array of things that can be done with those effects. For the follow up with you, if there's other resources or around that model that we go. Um, yeah, so we are continuing to look at um, purchasing additional devices. Um, our partnership, um, again, we have a partnership with the state of Maryland. Um, so, of course, funding and those devices are going to cost a whole lot of money, about $100 a device. Um, so, that's pretty much been the device that we've chosen to use our clients that have found it. Yes, yeah. okay. Um, so, I would like to announce that anybody who needs a booster shot. There are free boosters given out in, in the uh, Active Aging Expo. So we're gonna take a break in a little bit for an hour. We're gonna come back. Dr. Stone has agreed to come back for our afternoon panel. We have uh, three great panelists for the afternoon. Uh, I can take one last question. If you had a question, I don't wanna miss out on it. Uh, I, my name is Rosanna Coffey. I am formally a researcher now retired and uh as in my retirement i was trying to figure out what to do and so i uh, looked at some nonprofits, and i ended up with caring matters caring matters provides uh in-home kind of support up to four hours a week and um I think this may be a big untapped resource. There are people like me who want to do something that is uh, meaningful, gives you purpose, 
and, and uh, has that connectivity. We don't want a lot of responsibility. We don't want to have to do things we don't want to do. But I know a lot of people would like to have some connection and value in the community. So at Caring Matters, um, they take care of all the coordination. They call me up and they say, would you go visit so-and-so, figure out if you could get her through a physical therapy appointment, appointment. She's got dementia, this, this, and this, this. We've been trained um, by some excellent trainers. Uh, we are not the solution to all of your problems, but it is a good yeah. ancillary uh, contribution, I think. Thank you for that. Uh, and I believe Caring Matters has a table in the Active Aging Expo. So anybody who wants to get more information can go in the Active Aging Expo. I also encourage anybody who's interested in volunteering to, to go to the Montgomery County website. We have a great volunteering center within the county and you, there's many, many opportunities for people to, to volunteer. So again, let's give our panel great welcome. Thank you. And we'll see you in an hour. Hi, I'm Beverly Rollins. I'm a member of the Montgomery County Commission on Aging. My younger sister uh, suffered 36 years with multiple sclerosis. And my, even though she and my brother-in-law had some part-time caregivers, basically my brother-in-law was her primary caregiver. And um, one day he died suddenly of a heart attack. So that left me and my 85 year old parents basically in charge of her care. And I lived three and a half hours away. Uh, my parents, although they lived close by, they were 85 years old, they couldn't do that much. So basically it fell into my hands to be, to find her uh, caregivers. And I, um, I have a bachelor's degree in social work and I worked as a social worker early in my career. And then later I worked for a federal agency that deals with uh, older adults and with disabled individuals. And I, even with that experience, I had not a clue um, how to find caregiving organizations, especially three and a half hours away from me. So things were very chaotic um, right after my brother-in-law died. And uh, I didn't know where to look. So I went online and I did all these searches and I was panic stricken. I couldn't find anything, couldn't find anything, couldn't find anything. And finally, after, um, you know, maybe an hour of looking, I found this one that looked promising. So I called this phone number that for this care, what I thought was a caregiving organization and a nice woman answered the phone, First National Bank. I said, what? First National Bank? And I was so taken aback and so panic stricken, I just burst into tears. I thought I was finally finding somebody a caregiving organization. And the number on the search was for the bank, the First National Bank. So the poor lady who answered the phone was, <laughs> she didn't know what to do. She, she, she was, you know, she, she said, oh, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I said, I'm trying to find a caregiving organization. And she said, uh, oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've, I've seen a commercial on TV for this caregiving organization, hold on for a minute and I'll look it up in the phone book for you. So she looked it up and that's how I found my sister's caregiving organization. And I'm thinking if I had that much trouble and I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a trained social worker and I, I can't imagine that other people don't have that much trouble. And so we used this caregiving organization and I shortly found out that um, uh, that most of the care my sister needed 
was what insurance companies, Medicare, considered unskilled help. Although they're very highly skilled in what they do, it's like helping people get dressed, helping people fix their meals, helping them shower. And the insurance company and Medicare basically paid for a nurse to come in two or three times a week and spend maybe an hour. But that's not what my sister needed. And eventually my parents too. That's what not what she, they needed, you know, people to help them get dressed. What the insurance companies and Medicare consider unskilled help, but they are very skilled. And so my sister's husband, luckily, had been a federal employee and he left her a nice life insurance policy and, um, you know, thrift savings plan. But we wanted to keep my sister in her home. And so we, we hired these caregivers and we buzzed through my sister's uh, inheritance within two years. And then after that, the family had to kick in and pay for these caregivers so these so that my sister could remain in her house until until she died and i feel very grateful for that thank you welcome back everybody I'm so happy to be here today to announce the first two recipients of the Commission on Aging's new Community for a Lifetime Award. The purpose of the Community for a Lifetime Award is to formally recognize the important and beneficial work being done in the county that contributes to the Commission on Aging's vision and mission. The Commission on Aging nominates uh, potential award recipients that are then selected by an independent five-person panel representing the community at large. For 2022, the Commission on Aging has selected two participants for this, our first award. Our first award, is going to the Montgomery County Senior Nutrition Program. Here today to receive this award for the Senior Nutrition Program are Ms. Carol Craig, Director, and Rhonda Brandes, the SNAP Program Manager. We are very proud to give the award in recognition of the work that you and your staff have done providing and delivering food and nutrition services to older adults especially during the challenging time of COVID. Thank you for all that you do to make the county a community for a lifetime. Our second recipient is Ms. Marsha Prusan. This award is being given to Marsha in recognition of her demonstrated commitment to making Montgomery County a community for a lifetime. We recognize your hard work as a senior fellow with the age-friendly Montgomery program that benefits older adults in Montgomery County. Your efforts support the Commission on Aging's mission are, and are an essential part of the work being done by many people, organizations, communities, associations, and agencies in the county to meet the interests and needs of our older adult residents. Again, a special thank you from the Commission on Aging to our two recipients for the dedicated work that they are doing in the county to make it a community for a lifetime. So this afternoon's panel is gonna follow the same format that we had earlier. Uh, we're gonna go through introductions, then each presenter will have some time to talk, and then we leave it to you to, to ask questions. Uh, people at home, uh, we will get to your questions and answers uh, after the forum. So please feel free to put your Q&A in, in the Q&A section. Uh, as I introduced Dr. Stone earlier, I'll, I'll just do it for the benefit of those who uh, are here after lunch. Uh, Robin Stone, Doctor of Public Health, Senior Vice President for Research at Leading Age and Co-Director of the Leading Age Long-Term Services and Support Center at UMass Boston. She's a noted researcher and internationally recognized authority on long-term care, aging services, and workforce policy. 
She's been engaged in policy development program evaluation, large scale demonstrations and other applied research activities in these areas for over 40 years. Dr. Stone has held senior research and policy positions in both the federal government and the private sector, including serving in the US Department of Health and Human Services as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Disability, Aging and Long-Term Care Policy and Assistant Secretary for Aging in the Clinton Administration. Her work bridges the worlds of research, policy and practice to improve the care delivered to older adults, particularly lower income populations and to ensure best quality of life for these individuals and their families. Our next presenter is Tom Najjar. He's the founder and CEO of Care Plus Home Health, a private duty home care agency in Montgomery County. He is Lebanese by origin and grew up in Saudi Arabia. He's been in the US since high school and graduated from Florida State University with a business degree in hospitality administration and spent several years working in hotels and managing various restaurants in the DC metro area. Using his hospitality experience, Tom embarked on a career in the elder care community. He saw the need for affordable quality services that considered each client's unique needs and personalizing the care provided. As a result, in 1995, he launched Care Plus Home Health with a mission to provide professional compassionate care to individuals while maintaining their independence and quality of life. Tom's vision for Care Plus to be a partner, advocate, and friend to our clients and their families or his clients and families during challenging and transitional periods in their loved ones' lives. He utilized his company to personally provide service for his father when he needed care in the last months of his life in 2000. Tom believes in giving back to the community and volunteering, which is one of his guiding principles. His volunteer activities include being a board member and past president of the grassroots organization for the well being of seniors, an advocacy, education, public awareness, and networking group for senior serving professionals, as well as volunteering on numerous boards. Tom has strong involvement in volunteering in Boy Scouts of America and several other community partnership organizations. Thanks, Tom, for being here. Jennifer Long started with Montgomery County in 1995 as a contractor for aging and disability services. In 1998, she began working as client assistant specialist in what is now the Aging and Disability Resource Unit. She became a program manager of the unit in November 2006 and supervises the staff. Aging and Disability Resource Unit is the primary point of entry for aging and disability resource, aging and disability services. Staff provides hands-on assistance, referrals to services and specific information to seniors, people with disability, and caregivers over the phone and in person. She works with the Commission on Aging Communications Committee and the 50 Plus in Montgomery County Planning Group. 50 Plus is the monthly cable and YouTube news and information show. I'm sure you all watch it every month. We hope to get our ratings up. Jennifer grew up in Montgomery County and graduated from University of Maryland. College Park with a Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology, and she's probably the only speaker today that has a, a bunny in her array of, of pets. <laughs> Tina Purser Langley has worked in the aging. Thank you, Jennifer. Tina Purser Langley has worked in the aging field since 1993 at both the national and local levels. Her professional responsibilities have included directing a senior center, providing counseling to home care participants providing community services to seniors and educating nurses, physicians, and families about health and wellness resources in the community and managing grants and contracts. As a senior center director, she developed exercise classes to increase the range of motion and improve balance specifically for per persons diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, as well as classes for safe medication use and the importance of staying active. Tina also participated in the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Last Acts and helped support the Ends of Life coalitions around the country and county. Tina has also worked at Holy Cross Home Care and Hospice where she participated in clinical care meetings to implement individualized care for patients in skilled nursing facilities, adult daycare centers, assisted living facilities and private homes. 
In her current position as program manager for Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services, Aging and Disability Services, she's responsible for man managing and monitoring assigned contracts according to federal and state grant requirements. She provides staff support to the Commission on Aging's Health and Wellness Committee and the Montgomery County End of Life Care Co Coalition. She has been instrumental in securing new grants from the Maryland Department of Aging, focusing on medication management and falls prevention for older adults. Tina holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Weber State University, a Master of Science degree in Gerontology, as well as a Master's degree of Social Work, both from the University. Both of those are from the University of South Carolina. Thanks, Tina, for joining us today. Southern California. Southern California. <laughs> the other US. Okay. <laughs> so now I'd like to hand it back over to yeah. Robin. Well, um, I think some of you, many of you, most of you I saw in the morning, and probably a few new faces. Um, I, I wanted to uh, start this by continuing a little bit of the discussion that we had had earlier. And then, um, as I was saying to Tom, uh, turning it over to people who are actually in the trenches. Um, one of the things that I often found when I was a policy person in the federal government was that we were really like 30,000 feet away from everything and we hardly really knew what was going on. Um, when I moved to a large provider association in the early 2000s and again have been doing much more applied work within many, many provider organizations, particularly with frontline staff, uh, consumers of services and families you get to see the real nuts and bolts of how challenging the sector really is. And um, while policy, I think, can help us to set standards and regulate. It, it is at where the rubber hits the road that's going to be the most critical. And, and I think that for the commission itself, um, hearing from people who really engage in this work every day and how changes can be made to actually make things work better, I think is where it's going to be critical because we can have the greatest policies in the world uh, and they may not work. In fact, we see that frequently. Um, they're not necessarily in touch with what really has to happen on the ground. Um, two things that I wanted to mention that I didn't talk about this morning and Joanne and I talked a little bit about that in the at the break is what is the role of villages in Montgomery County? I don't know whether anybody can tell me how many villages there are. Anybody know? 30. 30. 30. So you've got 30 villages. I'm, I'm assuming that everybody knows what a village is. Um, a uh, primarily volunteer activity that is organized as a grassroots effort around a community. And really its focus is on peer to peer um, work and helping people engage uh, and take advantage of what's available in their communities, um, get to needed services if necessary uh, and have a meaningful life, which I think is really pretty critical. Um, I think that the, the potential for the villages to be a gap filler, both in terms of um, the social supports that are needed to keep people, particularly those who need in-home services, to keep them engaged and connected, as well as the variation that we're seeing in the service delivery that is occurring in some villages around the country. Um, there are more or less investment on the, on the actual service delivery side. Uh, I, I think of the villages more right now as primarily a social model, but we are seeing more and more villages depending on where you are. Um, a, a few of them in Massachusetts, a couple of them in California are actually now getting involved much more in in-home care and personal care. The other thing that I have been observing, and I don't know whether this is happening in Montgomery County, but I have a couple of colleagues who are involved in villages in Northern Virginia there's a lot more effort to actually hook up the villages with affordable senior housing. Um, because historically these villages have been primarily 
pretty well off, uh, typically mostly white, um, not incredibly diverse organizations. Again, I'm not stereotyping anyone because each village is its own entity, but I have seen efforts to really reach out to lower income communities. And I think this is a great trend uh, that I think uh, is going to not only help the villages themselves increase their diversity, but also actually help to support lower income older adults living in some of these affordable housing properties to, to, to have meaningful lives and to thrive. So um, if that isn't going on in Montgomery County in any of these villages, that's also something that may be considered, which is more and more formal connections between the villages and affordable senior housing properties. Um, the other question that I wanted to raise, and maybe we could talk about that after uh, we hear from the three speakers, is there is a lot of diversity in Montgomery County. Um, I, I'm amazed at the variation in ethnic and racial populations in particular. Um, tremendous growth since I first moved to the DC area and lived in Montgomery County. I, I was first living in Silver Spring, later lived in Bethesda. Um, but tremendous diversity in uh, people of Hispanic origin of very different groups, um, growing populations throughout Montgomery County. Uh, similarly, pe people of various Asian backgrounds, a very, very large Ethiopian population, probably one of the largest in the United States. And I could go on and on. And I would, I, I would love to hear, or at least think about what are the specific cultural adaptations that need to be made for these various populations that are living in Montgomery County and that are gonna be aging over the next, first of all, the baby boomers aging and then the next cohorts coming up after that. So what are the issues that need to be addressed culturally around that? Not just language, but real culture, cultural attitudes towards aging towards death and dying, towards Alzheimer's and dementia, towards service use. We know there in the literature and in the research that's done, including our own work, that there's tremendous variation in um, acceptability of services, use of services. And so what do we need to think about as the population really moves from a, a primarily non-white, a primarily white elderly population, which as I said, in the country, we've seen that um, by 2030, about a third of the older adult 65 plus population in the United States will be non-white. And um, in pockets of Montgomery County, my guess is it probably may be already there. So what are we doing both in terms of thinking about culturally competent service delivered, delivery targeting uh, matching between service deliverers and these various populations. And if there isn't matching, then how do we think about um, working on the cultural competence issues of various different kinds of staff taking care of very different kinds of older adults? That has been an issue for us already because our front line is very diverse and our older adult population has tended to be white. So there are significant issues around cultural competence just there. There's also cultural competence issues in terms of the diversity of the staff and upper management. And now we're going to see more and more diversity in the older adult population. So I think that's going to have implications for Montgomery County and how we think about designing services um, and systems to meet those various needs. So I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to the panel and then hopefully we will end up generating some really interesting discussion and uh, solve all the problems, hopefully, yes. for Montgomery <laughs> County by the time we leave here at two o'clock. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Dr. Stiles. Those are some thought provoking ideas. We should indeed try That's to solve all the world's problems today, right? <laughs> <laughs> no small feat. So you've touched on many topics all of equal importance, I'm going to focus on just one, and that's flex care or cluster care, as you may have heard earlier today. So we do this model. I believe, it, I, I believe it's successful. I think we've uh, seen in the last seven years of doing it at several locations that it's actually expanding. There's a need for it. 
and it's a neat model. So in a nutshell, what I, I look at FlexCare is uh, the ability to, to deliver services at a minimum number of, down to minutes really, 30 minutes at a time is our minimum, at locations where we have a, a population of people who are in need. Uh, there has to be an on-site office or on-site people providing that care because you, you're not going to have a caregiver driving from their home to a facility and leaving in 30 it's, it's, that's not possible. As we know, the labor market just shifted tremendously in the availability of caregiving population. So we have on-site locations, offices at uh, four locations and looking to expand. Of course, the challenge is making sure we have enough people to deliver the services. but. It is a successful thing. I'd love to see this expand into the county as a whole, but that would require additional resources, something we ourselves can't provide. We'd have to do a partnership with the county. So I'd love to advocate and speak to county level professionals uh, for the ability to provide some funding. Um, I've seen this, I've heard about it happening in places like San Diego. I'm not familiar with the name of the program, but I've heard that they provide about 50% of the funding. The other 50% is paid for by the families or the person in need of care. It, 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 most of us, if we need care at home, it's not eight hours a day. There's a few minutes at a time. You might need help in the morning, then there's a lull. Then at lunch, then there's a lull. So there's some time that's, I don't want to call it wasted, but there's, there's some paid time that's not really utilized but that's the nature of the beast. You have to pay someone to be there for the entire day, otherwise they're not coming. They've got to be, have a living wage as well. For cluster care, flex care, you can get that burst of care in the morning for half an hour to an hour, and then they're done. They come back the next day, if that's the time you need. Um, we do things like medication reminders or medication management, uh, come in to help with a quick bath or turn down service in the evening, um, wake up service in the morning, uh, transportation, go to the grocery store, help someone just ambulate to, to back and forth from the grocery store, uh, and a whole host of things. There, there's, a, there's no limit to what we can and can't do. It's just each person's needs are different, so we try to customize it to each uh, individual. Um, it works best in independent living communities where there's no care involved, so it becomes almost like a pseudo or hybrid assisted living model. We provide the assisted piece of it. And uh, the beauty of it is that the resident's paying rent, ideally, and rather than, I'm, no, no offense to any assisted living communities, we love them, we work closely with them, but you're paying a certain amount that's considerably higher than rent, right? Typically, eight to $10,000 in Montgomery County is not that unusual. Yeah. Uh, if, you're living, if you're paying rent in an apartment, you know, maybe two or 3000 that range, up or down, give or take. And if you need care, let's say there's an episode, a fall, you land in the hospital, come back and they tell you, well, you can't go home alone, you need some, some care. We've had this happen, this is a case in point. We have had a resident who was independent, just fine, took a fall, came back, needed 24-7 care. We provided that 24-7 care, then wound down to eight hours and four hours, then nothing. Then she was back, back on her own. So you're not gonna get that in assisted living. You're gonna be paying the same base rate regardless of what level of care you need. So it's a hybrid model. It's not for everybody. It may not work everywhere, but it's, I'd love to start the conversation for the uh, ability to expand this into other, uh, what we call NORPs, naturally occurring retirement communities, where you have more seniors living independently in apartment buildings to, to offer the service. So it's, a, it's up for discussion. I think I'm about five minutes. I don't want to overstay my <laughs> welcome here. So I'm going to pass it on. Okay. Thank you. I think you were unmute. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I think you were under your time. Uh, it'll all work <laughs> itself out. out. Uh, and, and my buddy's buddy. name is Jasper. Thank you. Um, so I'm Jennifer Long, and I manage the Aging and Disability Resource Unit, which has been mentioned a few times. So thank you all for already mentioning it. It's the, um, the Aging and Disability Resource Unit is the formal name. Uh, we're information and assistance, basically, for seniors, people with disabilities, and caregivers. It's the main phone line of Aging and Disability Services. So 2407773000 may not be news to the people who have joined us today, but people sometimes forget what's available. Uh, it doesn't occur to them to reach out to us. We do have an email address as well, uh, ads at montgomerycountymd.gov. And this is on the flyer that the screen is being shared right now. And we have uh, the flyer with some information on the back as well, the phone number and the email over on that table there with 
a plethora of other information from other uh, programs. And we have this, it's, we call it a sell sheet. We're not actually selling anything, uh, but it's an advertising term and we have it in Spanish as well. And then we have a multilingual flyer where there's a little less information to make room for uh, the contact information in other languages. Uh, so we you know, pass that out. And then I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Seniors Resource Guide. Uh, this is the, the newest edition, the 2022. And uh, you know, my staff do a lot of different things. They start by answering the main phone line, and sometimes there are people who have the means and resources and just don't know what's out there. So we give them information, uh, including the senior resource guide, and would let them know about some of the home care options available, like. Tom, who just spoke to us, and Visiting Angels, who spoke earlier this morning. Um, and then there are people who, uh, the other extreme, uh, adult protective services, uh, the you know, abuse or neglect or exploitation of a vulnerable adult. And so my staff would get enough information and send it to the clinical screening unit. Or if someone's calling with a need for in-home care, as Dr. Johnson mentioned earlier, and she mentioned our number as well, we would send it to the screening unit to see if they were eligible for the in-home aid service program in aging and disability services. We also uh, would ask questions if then to get more information from them about eligibility for home and community-based services uh, with Medicaid funding. And so my staff did the level one screening that would then get them on that path, either on the waiver registry that is very lengthy, or uh, if they actually have Medicaid, they might be able to pass through and, and get some of those services. Um, then there's just the uh, sort of things in between with, there are a lot of means tested programs and clients or residents don't know what they're eligible for. Anyone can call us or email us, uh, the, the client or resident themselves or someone may call for their neighbor, their family member. You know, we can hear from anyone. Uh, usually, though, we're going to want to ultimately speak to the client and get their specific situation. Everybody is ineligible for everything. Uh, there's income and asset limits for some of the things we help people apply for, like uh, energy assistance or SNAP, which used to be known as food stamps. Um, you can go to the next slide. There's also a lot of information on the county website. And so there is a senior site. It's, uh, on, you know, MontgomeryCountyMD.gov and it's backslash senior. Or if you typed uh, Google, excuse me, senior into the, you know, search bar, it, it would take you there. And there's um, a lot of information there. And, but then that not everybody's on the internet. That's not appropriate for everybody. Or sometimes that creates more questions or you need more info. And so by all means, reach out to us and we'll try to help you figure it out. Um, and then we, there, there's a, you can go to the next slide, there's a red envelope at the top of the county website. There's a, a few other things at the top of all the county pages, um, but the senior news gets sent out. That's just one of many electronic newsletters. Uh, the county has a variety of newsletters that go out so you can subscribe using this. Um, under HHS, though, is the senior news and a few others that might be a little more for this uh, targeted population. Um, so my staff just, they used to joke, oh, we do everything but windows. You know, you just, hopefully you all have heard of our unit and our phone number. Maybe you don't need it for yourself, but you tell someone else, or sometimes it doesn't occur to people to call us. It, we just try to help people figure things out. And then we can meet with people on an ongoing basis, come to events like this, go to senior centers. Uh, there are residents have a variety of needs. There are people who have a good support system and just needed information and some referrals. Then there are people who really need their hand held, the government bureaucracy, the application process, gathering verifications. It can be a lot. And walking them through that and helping people with that um, is a big focus of what we do. And I have one minute left, and I'm going to go ahead and pass it to uh, Tina. Thank you. Welcome. Yes, yes, you're welcome. Gonna, uh, right. yeah. yes, you're welcome. All right. Thank, Thank you, everybody. And thanks, um, Jennifer and Tom and Robin. I'm happy to be part of this panel and kind of closing down the day. Um, my role, I, my name is Tina Purser Langley, as um, David mentioned, and I'm the Senior Health and Wellness Coordinator. But for today's purposes, I'm going to talk about caregiving resources and caregiver resources in the county. Um, we wanted to just go through all the resources um, for caregivers, in-home care, anything that could touch somebody at home. Um, one of the things that I put together um, 
you'll see on the slide is just a list of respite services throughout the county. Um, as a caregiver myself, I was a, care, a long distance caregiver for over two years. And one of the things that I think people don't know that they need and don't know how to ask for is respite services. Um, and what is it? It's short-term relief for families providing ongoing care to frail older adults and people with disabilities. It can be provided in or out of the home. Um, Montgomery County actually has a lot of respite resources. Um, we have over 30 agencies providing care throughout the county. And one of our main providers is the ARC of Montgomery County. And I listed it here um, on my slide. So you can go to the website, you can see the, um, the, different, the 30 different um, agencies providing respite care. You call them, and as Jennifer was mentioning, you call or you go to their website and, and see, um, try not to be put off by a lot of a bureaucracy, you know, fill out the forms, make the call, do apply for um, the resources that we do have available. As somebody mentioned um, earlier today, Caring Matters is another agency throughout the county that provides respite care. They were formerly known as Hospice Caring. They serve children, adults, families facing serious illness, grieving death of a loved one. But you can get up to four hours a week of free respite care by trained volunteers. And we have some um, brochures over there on the table as well. Medical adult daycare, that's another respite resource that people don't think of. Um, licensed medical adult daycare centers are comprehensive programs specifically tailored to adults who need supervision and assistance during the day. Based in the community, we have a lot of medical adult daycare centers and some that provide different languages too. So you can take your loved one and the medical adult daycare are Korean, Chinese, some that um, speak Spanish, and it's a safe place to keep your loved one while you get some respite. Um, Medicaid does provide some reimbursement or there's some sliding scale fees also for medical adult daycare. Social day programs. I wanted to mention this one as well because we have two sites in our county that provide social day programs. This is another respite program, um, Jewish Council for the Aging, and they're called Kensington Clubs. And they're weekly programs and they provide a social purpose. So people with early stage dementia can go to these programs. The caregivers can get four to six hours of respite. And the, um, the charge for these programs are minimal. We have two right now in the county. One is at a recreation center that we're very happy um, that that's a new model for us. It's in one of our rec senior centers. And the other one as at, is at Jewish Council for the Aging. They're affordable and people should really take advantage of those as well. In-home non-medical programs, we talked about that earlier with um, Dr. Kimberly Johnson. I wanted to mention that as well. We go through the companion care and personal care, but again, we can call the Aging and Disability Resource Unit to try to get information on all these. We have a lot of services in the county. Also, if you call that line, Jennifer, can't we get, um, someone in different languages to interpret or to be? Um, yes, we, we have mm -hmm. access to the language line. So any language we can accommodate over the phone and then the unit is comprised of eight staff and two of them speak Spanish, uh, but when they're answering the phone and then even in person, we can arrange mm -hmm. for interpretation, of course. I, want, I wanted to highlight that because as Robin was saying, our county is so diverse. And when somebody wants to get some services, we have to be equipped with different languages. And so our aging um, and disability research unit is equipped and a lot of our programs and materials over on the resource table are in different languages. So please take advantage of those. Next slide. I just wanna show you some of the resources we have. Our caregiver guide to caregiver supports over it's on the resource table. It's in different languages, caregiving fact sheet, caring matters, um, and also uh, caring for an adult for adult daycare. One of the other resources that I haven't talked about is our vial of life. 
Um, and these are magnets that can be put on refrigerators. You take out the sheets and you can put all of your medications on here too. So when our fire and rescue staff come to the house, if 911 is called, they go and look on the refrigerator for your vial of life. And then they can see if you don't have someone to speak for you or has your medications, your medications can be listed here. And I've been given the one minute sign. I don't know if I've used my minute or that's it for me, but I, <laughs> I'm good. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Question, good afternoon. My name is Annie. To address the home care shortage, especially low and middle income population, may I know if it is plausible to have high school students provide in-home care services? They can also fill up their volunteer hours and they can have more involvement in the society, which is a win-win-win situation. Um, so I, I guess I'm gonna throw that out to you all, but I also wanted to mention that um, this, the, the relationship with the high schools is really critical in terms of developing a pipeline for this workforce and probably even more critical now uh, because of the terrible shortages that we have. So we need to start getting young people interested in our sector and to see our jobs as not just dead end, but actually as opportunities for entry level and then for growth. Um, we have some examples in our leading age membership, uh, one in New York City in particular, a very, very large provider of uh, multi-setting uh, care, including a lot of home care called the New Jewish Home, which is headquartered in Manhattan. And then they have uh, satellite organizations in a number of the boroughs, created a geriatric care academy at the provider level about 10 years ago. And they have relationships with all of the school districts in New York City. They have graduated hundreds of young people from high school through their career, career academy. And the, the students actually are placed at the site, go out and do home care visits, as well as assisted living and nursing home. Uh, as part of their curriculum. So they're actually learning on the job as part of their high school. Uh, when they graduate, um, some have actually become aides and have stayed with the organization. Others actually go on to get other professional degrees. They have examples of some of the young people who have become nurses. Others have become, a couple have become physicians. They have a very strong history of success with this program. And partly it is because it is provider driven and grassroots grown. So it's not coming from the outside in, it's actually coming from the employer out to say, we want to work with you as a high school or as a school district to grow these jobs. They also have a young adult program for students who, for example, never finished high school. Um, so there's a whole other program and their graduation rate for all of these is extremely high. And um, it's just one example, but I, I think that the potential for working with the, um, with the high schools, and I know that I am on the board of Ingleside, which uh, is one of the providers, uh, life plan communities in this area. Uh, King Farm is the Maryland site and we actually have a relationship with Gaithersburg High where we have been graduating uh, students with aid certificates and they are working in our organizations, including our new in-home service program that was developed and a new continuing care at home program that was just developed in combination with Goodwin House out of Northern Virginia. So, I just wanted to throw that out there. I think there's a lot of opportunity for high school relationships. And I was wondering where you all think that might fit. If anybody. I'll let you answer first. I have a couple of things to say there, but I'm curious. I'm, I'm counting with It's a nice thought. thought, of course. I think, I don't know if Dr. Johnson would weigh in, because it's a little different, you know, if you're hiring minors, high school students. Mm -hmm. Uh, would they, they would, I think, need some guidance. Maybe, I don't know if there could be a county group that would could take it on or a home 
care agency that would have that as a subset and it'd be under their tutelage. Licensing regulations that, that we're under, we have to follow certain criteria, meaning providing somebody who's already trained. Uh, this would be somebody in training, which would mean they'd have to shadow someone. Mm -hmm. So now you're doubling up expenses. I'm not sure how you cover the cost of that if you're out in the field. So there are some... Yeah, and I think in the Jewish home case in New York City, first of all, there's there was significant fundraising for this program. In addition, the school district started putting in money because they had a very strong formal relationship with the school. Oh, there was also a question about background checks. Yes, at, in, is, are there background checks? I mean, I think the only way that these programs could work is if they meet all the criteria for how you're actually establishing a pro, an aid program. So yes, there would have to be background checks. If it's in training, you actually have to have shadowing and it would be under some kind of apprenticeship auspice. Um, but I think the idea of really more formally, as formally as possible, linking the schools and the provider communities and the county itself just makes a lot of sense. So I, I don't know, um, anybody got any questions for our for any of our speakers this afternoon or comments? Yes. Hi, my name is Janice Sandy. Tina, you mentioned just in talking to Cassie that people need best of care and don't even know to ask for it. And I'm thinking when you were giving your list, social daycare would be another thing people might not know about. So what are you, other ways, ways, like if you call that numbers, 73,000, do the operators offer additional information than what people are asking for because they don't know to ask? Or is there other ways that we can get information out to people that don't know what to ask for? Yeah, it's just eight drugs on meetings. Thank you. Um, we get a lot of questions. You're right. People sometimes call, they might say, I'm calling for adult protective services, or they may say, I'm concerned about my neighbor. Okay. And so, yes, the staff, their client assistance specialists have to get more information and really have a conversation. So right, a lot of people aren't going to call and say, I'm looking for social daycare or even medical daycare or even daycare, <laughs> you know, and so you, uh, yes, some people, where's the nearest senior center? Oh, is there anything else I can help you with? No, I'm good, you know, and fine, uh, but we try to send them literature and yes, ask more questions. Oh, what else is going on? How are you getting to the doctor? What, you know, family situation, income, etc. cetera. So um, yes, we should be educating people too. But people, right, don't even know what they're asking for, but they explain their situation and then we go from there. Um, we also have um, a caregiver uh, support program manager. She's no longer with us, but she used to have a YouTube channel where she would bring all these people on and people could watch you know, her being interviewed and talking about these programs on YouTube channel and things like that. So we're trying to get it out there um, and, you know, you don't know what you don't know, and you don't know how to ask for things either. So just trying to market and get some um, public information out there about these programs. It seems like a lot of times when we do mention, we always get questions, how do you hear about it? So we try to get into the different markets where our seniors are and where people are um, to let them know about our services. Thank you. Yeah. Entirely different matter, but um, I'm really impressed that everybody tries to talk about how good things are, but there are problems. And one of the things that people don't do is voice their grievances. There are problems with any sort of business. Um, I understand some states are expanding the ombudsman program to go and evaluate in-home situations. Um, and I was wondering if there is any movement in Maryland to do this uh, because quality assurance, I think is very important uh, and, and for any sort of, of care. And I was uh, perhaps directing it to the, the agencies to find out if anything is uh, in the works for that. I'm not sure. We have, you know, the long-term care ombudsman program is part of aging and disability services and it's for nursing home and assisted living facilities. I'm not sure if there are uh, efforts, uh, you know, separately there's licensing and regulatory, mm -hmm. other avenues, um, but specifically ombudsman expansion, I, I don't know about.
right? That doesn't mean it's not happening. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but if you if you call our ombudsman and there's a complaint or a grievance or there's something, they will work very hard to you know see how they can we could provide resources or our adult protective services would look into it. We would have a number of different channels, I think, that would look into something, but as a whole, I don't I'm not sure if we're there yet. General way than just for Montgomery County. Um, my group has been extremely concerned about the explosion of home care um, over the past, particularly the past decade. And this, again, as I think I said in the morning, this incredible, um, almost exultation around everybody wants to stay in their own home and let's just move everything into home care. Um, we are very concerned about actually the frontline staff um, who is the person who is going in to actually work with the resident or the, the client. And often there's maybe a family member there, there may be nobody there. So we're just talking about two people. Um, we have done interviews with aides, we have done interviews with agencies, and we have gotten from agencies how wonderful their onboarding program is, how terrific their training is, their in-service, because they all think they will tell you that they always hire trained aides, but their in-service is terrific. Um, they have supervision, they actually um, have supervision and sh shadowing of aides in the home. When we talk to the aides, we have almost none of that coming back to us. The aides will tell you that their onboarding for the most part has been awful. Um, they get almost no good in-service training. Oftentimes they are sent to a home where they have absolutely no idea beforehand what the conditions of the person is that they're going to the home. So. We had one person who was telling us about very, very heavy duty Parkinson's challenges, knew nothing about this at all, and ended up getting some training from the family member who happened to be there. Um, no supervision. They don't know who their supervisor is. They will frequently say the only person they call is the scheduler. So that's just the that's just the side from the front line. In this case, we didn't interview the consumers, but I will tell you this is a dyad. And it may even be triad, it may even be a quadrad because you've got an employer, an aide, the client, and the family. And the potential for dysfunction anywhere there is tremendous. And the lack of quality assurance is huge. Um, I personally am not a heavy um, supporter of, of heavy regulation because I don't think it's actually helped us very much. In, improving quality. I think regulation can get rid of really bad actors. I think the role of the ombudsman is really strong, but most ombudsman's programs are very underfunded, and so they hardly have any resources to go into the home. I think, again, this is something that we need to think about from a county level of what, what are the, what's the infrastructure that is needed to support good home care. And I would argue it starts from really good training, really good employer practices, um, and really good education of the family and the client. All of that has to happen. So I'll stop there, but I'm glad you raised the question because yeah, this isn't all hunky dory and um, it's much harder to do quality assurance. I know that Joanne mentioned brain cans, which sort of made my skip fall because you know, the notion of privacy and the notion that everybody who had a home care visit would have a brain cam in their home. I just came you know, off with the ethical issues and the concerns around what does that mean? But I do think we need to seriously take this quality assurance issue seriously. So I don't know if I can uh, do that one. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm hardly aware of comment on everything that was said, but I want to just inject one um, other resource that. I think it's very much publicity because it's actually a very small program, but <clears throat> Home Care Partners does have a small program that is funded by the county council 
It was funded by the city of Gatesburg, it was funded by various family foundations, what we call Life Care, which is a central cluster care that um, Tom spoke about. We're in, I think, six buildings, about six buildings in Montgomery County. But this is a model where we're able to go in and provide that two or three hours a week of care. It's going to be a lot of personal care, a lot of heavy duty care, but you need somebody to come in and do some housekeeping, maybe take the trash out, do the laundry. Maybe be there when they take their bath and leave. Um, we try to do it in buildings where we cluster so we're a little more efficient. Unfortunately, I wish I could say that, um, like Tom, when we had an hour, uh, um, generally we do about two hours time loss because it's more efficient. Uh, there is no cost to the client. They do have to qualify based on income. It's for low income individuals. But um, I do want to mention that there's a little bit of room to expand it. So um, certainly it's, it's another resource that's available. That's a wonderful resource. Thank you for telling us. Um, I would hope that it might at some point be available for the gap population because that would be really helpful. But I just want to go back to the quality insurance. Um, which I think is a real problem in homes. Uh, I believe Maine is one of the states that does have long term care, but it's been going into the houses. Maryland, Montgomery County, Maryland, but it's not. Um, but I just wanted to bring up, I think everyone's assuming that, and I'm, I'm honestly taking advantage of having this big audience here, everyone's assuming that um, quality assurance is working at least a little better in nursing facilities. Well, no, don't, don't, don't do that yet until I see what I want to say, please. Um, that at least the inspectors are going in and, and the nursing homes are being surveyed. And I just want to point out that right now, if anyone doesn't know, that it's not happening in Montgomery County mm -hmm. facilities because uh, there was a memorandum of understanding where uh, county staff went into the facility and they terminated that memorandum of understanding effective July and since then there have been maybe tops six surveys and two complaint surveys and a lot more complaints than that. So that's just a problem going on right now in our county that even though I realize this is about in-home care for those that are not in home, there still is a big problem. I mean, one way to deal with some of that is to think about trying to have a registry. I don't know whether Montgomery County has a registry of, of in-home care workers, but there are mechanisms that other states and areas have used to actually at least have some oversight and even having public authorities or some other entity that can actually do some of that oversight for independent providers because it is it's just it is a serious challenge if i may touch on uh, from a private agency perspective it's in, it's in our best interest to make sure we deliver quality care and all, all the comments I heard are, are accurate. Yes, you, you, you run the risk of, we have hundreds of caregivers, thousands of caregivers in homes and throughout the county. They're working autonomously. There's no nurse overseeing them like in a hospital-based setting or a nursing home. So you do the best you can to train them. And we do have on-site supervision, but let's be honest, once every 30, 90 days, you know, a caregiver could be gone here. And we're, we're, not, we're selling a promise not selling a Cadillac or a, or a Chevy. We're a, a person. People have emotions, feelings, good days, bad days. They get sick. They, they don't show up sometimes, and things like that do happen. We do the best we can to monitor, but there's no way we can perfect it. Uh, you know, we, we, 
absolutely do the best we can. We have outside, I have a third party company serving both our clients and caregivers. So how are you doing? Are we getting the cases you want? Is there communication? Right. And we get, we get surveyed, we get a mark. And, and when we get a mark below six, I get an email, low score. So I get to read what that was about. And usually it's anonymous because there was a mix up in the telephone communication between us and maybe in the client. Uh, so we do get things like that. We do the best we can, but there's always that unknown of, of, of the, is the caregiver there doing her job properly? Or, you know, the, and, and I've had clients who have the granny cams in the homes and they, I don't know if they work really because, well, I didn't see her with my mom five minutes ago. She must have been sleeping. You know, you get all sorts of things like that. You don't know how accurate that is or not. But I do believe most agencies, reputable ones, it's in their best interest to do the best they can to ensure quality of service. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, we want to thank our panelists for today. We really appreciate you being here. I want to call up Barbara Selter, Chair of the Commission. Our speakers today spoke about how helping older adults age in place is a significant challenge. The Commission on Aging developed this public forum to create awareness of this important topic, highlight some insights into the types of home care available, and present useful and advocate useful advocacy and forward thinking ideas our community can implement to make life better for older adults. I want to thank the city of Gay. Petersburg and all our wonderful speakers. Thank you to our keynote speakers and to our panelists. Thanks also to the many people who worked on and participated in the logistics of the event planning, including Charlene Simpson from the city of Gaithersburg, the Commission on Aging Public Forum Committee, and our county liaisons. In closing, I want to thank you, the audience for spending your valuable time today listening and learning about this critical issue. Many of us are, um, have been family caregivers and many of us plan to be family caregivers in the near future. So we know the challenges firsthand. I wanna be sure that everyone is aware of the excellent resources that Montgomery County already has for those in need. Once again, these resources can be found on the county website, as well as by calling Aging and Disabilities Information Line. That's 240-777-3000. Let me repeat that, 240-777-3000. I hope that today's public forum will act as a catalyst for county leaders, caregivers, healthcare workers, and others working with older adults to look for ways to improve the overall quality of in-home care we provide, making aging in place easier, more affordable, and safe in the place we know as home. We can all be change agents by putting together what we have learned today into practice and into advocacy. Working together, we can do better and establish Montgomery County as a community for a lifetime. Thank you all for attending.